sure every single day, every nook and cranny was the exact same, otherwise it would alter the flavour of the whiskey. Come on, follow me.
Hartelijk, hartelijk welkom vanavond in de Bali. Mijn naam is Jurie Albrecht, ik ben de inhoudelijk directeur van de Bali. En um, I'm going to continue in English, because this evening is going to be in English. It's the first evening in this series, which is going to be in English. Um, because before this we had Arnon Grunberg talking to Job Cohen, to Micha Wertheim, um, to other people. Um, we staged this, this series because we think it's very important that we have a place in Amsterdam where art meets politics or science. And that we have a long time to speak to each other because if you listen to the radio, if you watch TV, it's hardly possible to really see a dialogue um, on some sort of a level. So we're very happy that Arnon Grunberg invited Thomas Sattlisek. We're very, very happy to have you both here. Um, I'm not going to introduce you. That's Arnon Grunberg going to do. Um, this is uh, the first series of this year. We're going to do several others this year. And I'm, um, I'm very happy that you're both here. Enjoy your evening. Good evening, Thomas. Um, Thomas and I just had dinner, and over dinner, Thomas said, the question doesn't matter. And my aim tonight is to ask at least one question that matters. And can I pick it? Uh, you can pick it. <laughs> Let me know afterwards with the Which question. Yes, exactly. Maybe you will not even recognize it. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, okay. may, yeah, maybe not. Um, Thomas and I met a few months ago in March, I believe, at the Prague Writers Festival. Then I thought that you were a novelist. Soon I discovered that you were an economist. Yes. For a while, I thought yes, you had also written a novel, but tonight you told me that that's not true. That's false. I don't remember writing one. You don't, but you. Yeah, you I have to check my CV. Yeah, maybe, maybe unconsciously you wrote one, but you maybe. told me that that you would like to write a novel. Yes. And one of the. If I already wrote it, then I'm not going to. To do, do. The so same you check if again. you wrote it, and maybe okay, that's that's a good that's good. Um, one of the main arguments in in the book, and the book is the the, the reason why we are here tonight. Uh, your book, Economics of Good and Evil, the quest for economic meaning from Gilgamesh to Wall Street, is basically that the eco economists uh, focus too much on numbers, and they should turn to philosophy, psychology, literature. So there is a connection between you and a novel already in this book. Uh, to give the people who haven't read this book yet uh, um, an idea of what it's about, I'd like to show a short uh, film that I found on YouTube, of course you know it. It's a film where you um, basically explain the first macroeconomic um, prediction in the world. Okay. You know what will come. Okay, let's, let's see the... One of the claims that I have is that economics has become religion uh, or priests, we do a similar thing, people listen to the question, what shall I do, which was originally placed, uh, asked, people ask Jesus this question, this is what um, we ask economists today. As you know, the government has two tools how to influence the economy. One is called the fiscal policy, and the other one is called monetary policy. And let me tell you, in both of these um, uh, policies, uh, an alternative uh, explanation how, how these developed. Let's start with fiscal policy. Monetary policy, just briefly put, is the monopoly of the government to print money. This is, of course, simplification, but for the purposes of the debate, this will suffice. And fiscal policy is the monopoly of the government to indebt others, as if in your stead. We are now in sort of a, a business cycle, a very, very strange kind of a maybe we're getting from the bottom back again, but it definitely is a business cycle. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what was the very first business cycle and compare it to the current most recent one. Okay, so what is the oldest business cycle in the written history of mankind? <laughs> it is the Pharaoh's dream in Genesis chapter 32 when, when Pharaoh had a dream about seven fat and seven lean cows. This is the very first business cycle that we know of in the history of mankind. I, I, I tried to search deeper, I couldn't find any, anything uh, as close as, as this. So Pharaoh has a dream, seven fat cows, seven lean cows, he doesn't know what to make of it, so he calls Joseph. Joseph is a, is a Hebrew prophet and he says, well, congrat in today's language of course, he says, congratulations Pharaoh, you just had a macroeconomic prediction 14 years uh, ahead of time, so to speak. You will have, and this is the point where I will use the flip chart, 
<laughs> you will have seven years and seven bad years, lean years. So here we have grain, or today we would say GDP. So he asks, what can be done? And uh, Joseph says, well, you know, because he was reading your great economist, John Maynard Keynes, so he was educated in Keynesian. He said, well, in the good years, do not eat everything that grows, but save, and he says, one-fifth, this is, of course, 20% of GDP growth and um, store it as a sort of an energy in your store grain houses as if in a battery. And then, of course, this is not hard to predict, spend it, invest it uh, during the bad years. So in other words, here he was doing saving. And then this word is investment. This one we know very well. So, in other words, you take the energy from the good years. So, in other words, you slow down GDP growth, which is a common misunderstanding, the understanding that I think politicians and the general public have, and even many economists about themselves, that the role of the economist is to increase GDP growth. This is nonsense. The role of the economist is to decrease the amplitude of the business cycle. So, if we are to increase GDP growth from minus 10 to, say, minus 3, then we must inevitably slow down GDP growth during the bad years. So in other words, in good years do, uh, well, in bad years do expansionary fiscal policy and in good years do contractory fiscal policy. In other words, um, today we would say take in more taxes, this is T, than you give out in expenditures. This sounds very provocative, but the economy behaves often like a bipolar, um, patient with a bipolar disorder, it tends to overdo its good uh, uh, years and turn them into ma ma manias, and it also tends to exaggerate its bad moods and turn into depression. Now, those of you who have ever encountered bipolar disorder or manic depressive uh, situation, you know that the first thing to treat if you want to treat a patient in this situation is you treat the manias. Now, let's fast forward some 3,000 years till today. Okay. We also had seven very good years. In fact, if you want to be somewhat ironic, you could even go down and say that th these seven years have been bracketed by two significant events in the history. One was the year 2001, which wasn't just important for the September attacks, but you know that this was the last year when America had surplus budget in, in, in the Clinton administration. This is the year when, when the presidency changed. This is also the year when, um, uh, when Fed started charging extremely aggressively low levels of, of, of interest rate, etc., etc. And uh, the world had a great seven years, not just America, not just Great Britain, but the whole of Europe, and in fact, the whole of our civilization, and even um, the whole world. The whole world grew in average in 5% uh, uh, GDP growth per year, which is, which is crazy. This was ended by Lincoln Brothers, 2008, and it was also September. So anyway, my point here is it was seven good years, even in our times, that we actually enjoyed this robust levels of growth. So what have we done? Just to speed up the thought, we've done this. We've done exactly the opposite. We've spent more than we grew. So not only did we eat everything that we could, but this was not only empty, but it was full of IOUs lying all over the floor. Ridding ourselves, of course, of any energy left to save or cushion the bad years. We should have had budget surpluses here, saving energy for, for, for bad years. Instead, we did the exact opposite. Well, anyway, what's my point? My point here is that a story that we tell to seven-year-old children that they can understand, story which is from primitive times of some 3,000 years, story which actually only has very few uncomplicated numbers and no calculations, 
had in it more wisdom than we have today. We've not been able to persuade our politicians to keep to this basic wisdom with hundreds of thousands of very highly educated economists with all sorts of mathematical models and regressions. We've not been able to. We've, not, we've been able to actually overlook this sort of basic, uh, basic wisdom that uh, we've seen human, mankind uh, adopt during the first recorded business cycle. Thank you for this explanation here. Um, I think you make, we will, one of the chapters in your book is about the Old Testament, and then we will talk a bit more about uh, Moses and, and these uh, predictions. But in, in this short film, you, you make two provocative statements. First of all, you are saying that the economy is a bit like a patient with a, uh, with a, with a disorder, with a bipolar disorder. And the second, also quite provocative statement, is that, that not only the politicians, but also the economists should have read the Bible more carefully. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't we do that? Why didn't they do that? Let's start there. Um, uh, you know, it has to do, I think, with the mania, because um, one of the f first descriptions of a patient in the manic stage is that he feels like a demi-god, or maybe a, a god, god proper. We feel that we understand everything, we are spending much more money than we can afford and it seems like the world is rosy and better still a rosy outlook this is exactly if you deconstruct the macroeconomic situation and also the predictions this falls very well in that category so if you actually took all the literature that we had during these you know jolly years and you gave them to a psychoanalyst he would say well you know this is this is um, this is this is manic so the first mistake we did I think, and we're learning that it was a mistake, is that we thought that we understand what's happening. We thought we have it figured out. Um, we meaning economists, economists, politicians. Economists, especially economists, all politicians, but also the general public. We thought, you know, Alan Greenspan was named, uh, you know, the, the, the one economist who has invented a non-cyclical economy. It was supposed to just go up all the time. Everything's going to be even better and better. Uh, it's actually interesting even to, to take this debate, this is an old video, but uh, the debate today, you know. Um, uh, so the first description of a mania is that you spend much more money than you, you can afford. Secondly, you have this very sanguine, optimistic outlook of the present and the future. And third, very interesting, these people are very efficient, very productive, and very hardworking during their manic stages. They basically don't sleep, they work all the time. They're as efficient and as productive as you could have them. Now, uh, let's take Greece and Ireland and compare them. Let's say, okay, Greece is an economy that is depressed, let's say. Um, of course, if you read between the lines, what you get is if Greeks would work twice as much as they do, they wouldn't have a problem. Let's take the same view, the same grid, and let's have a look on, for example, Ireland. The case there is exactly the opposite. It's a manic situation. So if, if Irish bankers, especially, work half the time they did, they wouldn't have a problem. And uh, you know, the Irish situation is much more fundamentally the root of the problem. The Greek problem isn't really sort of, it's a friendly fire casualty mm -hmm. of war. It's actually intellectually uninteresting. Everybody in this room knows what to do. Wasn't it, it was a Dutch politician, I think, who said some years ago, you know, the problem with politicians is not that we don't know what to do. We know precisely what to do. What we, not, what we don't know is how to get elected after no. doing it, you know. <laughs> and, but with Greece, it's clear. Everybody sort of on a technical level knows what to do. But what should you do with Ireland, the Irish crisis, or the um, American crisis? And this, I think, is the root of the problem, you know. It's not the lack of growth that led us into the crisis, as is commonly, uh, you know, said in the media, but it's actually too much of it. Most economies went bust while actually full throttle uh, growth what was happening. The, alcohol, the um, depression allegory also works very well with alcohol. Uh, it's like if you try to treat an alcoholic by treating his hangovers, or her, of course. We have to speak politically correctly. So uh, if she is a drunkard, 
uh, you're not really helping her or him uh, much by solving the, the hangover problem. You know, let's imagine that we invent a magic bullet to solving mm -hmm. the hangovers, which everybody would very much like. Will that help the alcoholism? No, it will probably make alcoholism even worse. If you want to treat an alcoholic, you have to treat the excessive usage of alcohol. And even this parallel, I think, even goes further. I don't know how you say that here in, in, in Netherlands, but when we get a little bit too intoxicated, in the morning, yes. we say we take uh, by the hair of the dog. What killed you yesterday Today. will help you. Again. Huh? You will, so you drink a little bit of beer or booze? Yeah, whatever yeah, it was, whatever. if you can remember. If you can remember. What, course, whatever yes. it was yeah. Uh, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. That's helpful. And we are seriously applying the same method in our macroeconomic policy. Let me demonstrate three points. First of all, the common sort of consensus among economists is what led us into the crisis was too much consumption on cheap credit. Fine. What's the solution now that we are in the middle of crisis? Even more consumption. The problem is we don't consume enough. We don't, you know, we, people we don't should, spend enough. You know, they should go no. back into their manias. Second example. Um, what was the problem, especially with Fed, too cheap money, too low interest rate. What's the solution to the problem? Cheaper money. Exactly. Even more cheaper money. And you can even go with the rating agencies. What was the problem? Too sanguine rating agencies giving triple A's with pluses to everybody that they met on the street. What's the solution? Well, even more triple, quadruple A's, if possible. You know how Sarkozy reacted in the frantic fury of, of, of fear when France was, was being downgraded. Right. I mean, everybody you know, saw that they're not as beautiful as they used to be when they were young. But the problem was, you rating agencies are causing the crisis because you are actually admitting the real situation. Right. And we don't have any other cure except for, for you know, um, whatever killed us. And the same thing goes for growth, you know. This is but before we go back to the Bible, to the Old Testament, are you saying that bankers and also politicians shouldn't see economists but should go to psychoanalysts? Or is this what you are suggesting? I mean, well, I'm saying this in jest, but it's a bit more than that. I mean... Yeah, I think there is lots of that. I think there is... I mean, you can hear it... What I really enjoy doing, you take the most serious analysis, I don't know how many economists are here in the room or how many of you read it, but do it once in a while. Take a very serious uh, a banking statement and read it very carefully. Most, uh, most enjoyable is to read something that's like one year old. There you see it very clearly. But the markets are nervous. The markets are, uh, uh, the sentiment of the market is, these are all code words for we don't know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, or the markets are acting in an irrational way, or we have animal spirit at work. Animal spirit you know, sounds can, very yeah. scientific, but uh, all that it says is uh, sometimes human beings behave we don't know. We don't know, but that's animal spirits come from Keynes. That's right. And it's also in your book. That's you, right. Yeah. So, so yeah. this is a perfect excuse for everything. You know, we have, I think, this holy triangle in economics. One is called the invisible hand of the market. The other one is called homo economicus. And the third one is called animal spirits. In between this triangle, you can explain anything. And you, of course, do it psychologically. I mean, my son, I have a five-year-old son, so I watch with him, I watch with him these ch children's stories. And he used to like... And the teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. So if you take the English words and you randomly select words, you are more likely to come up with something more sensible than teenage, mutant, ninja, turtles. I mean, these four words have no meaning whatsoever. Well, maybe there's one other phrase that is a little bit more crazy than teenage, mutant, ninja, turtles, and that is invisible hand of the market. I mean, that's even, I mean, I can get the teenage mutant fighting t Ninja Turtles, but what exactly do I mean? Um, and this is serious economists who don't believe in mythology, uh, yet we are using this, using this every day. And the question that you always have to say, there is no other way of phrasing, is do you believe Mike, in yes. the invisible hand of the market? And the answer is yes, I do believe, I, or I don't believe. So it is a psychological discipline, of course. Speaking of myth mythology, um, in your book you make the case that, that economists uh, should study the mythology more carefully. And, and in this, this, this video we just saw, uh, you make it quite clear that... that, that I, I ask myself the question, why hasn't come up 
Why is, are you the first one to come up with this idea about going to the Bible? It, it's so clear. Why, why haven't we studied the Bible before you? Because we think it has nothing to do with each other. It's we think the Bible is not connected to the economy. Yeah, we feel that, it's, that art, Bible, faith, beauty, uh, subjectivity is on the polar opposite to science, hard facts, numbers, laws. Uh, this, I think, is, 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 is what led us also partially into this. Um, I think it's easy to show that the economy would not be able to stand without religious norms. And Max Weber and others made this, so I'm not, I will try to make a more difficult case. I even would like to argue that religion does not stand without economics. Take Christianity, for example. What is so special about Christianity compared to other religion? It's this whole idea of redemption. Somebody pays for your sins. And uh, in original Greek, the word sin and debt yep, same. Are, are, are synonyms. In, in German, it works the same, schuld. It also works in Aramaic, and it also works in Latin. Demini nos, debita nostra. So you have your debit card. Diminish our, our debits. Is, is, is forgive us our debts forgive as we sins. forgive those yeah. who are. This was the prayer of the Wall Street boys. Forgive us our debts, as we don't forgive those who are indebted to us. And in fact, if you really want to stretch it, um, take uh, on a Sunday, take Financial Times or whatever you have, and substitute the word debt for sin, and you really get a gospel. <laughs> so let me translate, okay? The Greeks are falling under the weight of their sins, debts. They can no longer carry their sins. They need a redeemer. Somebody with higher credit. Credit in Latin is belief, faith. To redeem them, to take over their sins and pay for them. So, you know, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, to separate. Only thing you need to know, it's even credit crunch, if, you know. If we take the New Testament again seriously, we should have forgiven the Greek people. Yeah, and in, and fact, in fact, the debate, should we forgive Greeks or not, is... I would argue, the Christian 2,000-year-old debate, law versus grace. Should we treat them according to the law? I mean, you guys signed it. It's the law. Follow the law. Or should we be graceful and forgive them? And then, how many times should I forgive? If my brother, you know, <laughs> that's against me, should I forgive him seven times? Or, you know, 77? Um, of course, the solution isn't there, but it's the same, same debate. Even the word credit crunch, if you translate that into, from Latin into English, it means faith crunch. And this, I think, is the fundamental problem. Our faith has crunched. We, have, we don't know what to believe anymore. This is why I think there's so much hatred going through economists. Not that we earn too much money, or, or I mean, sports people and artists also, um, some yeah. of them earn you know, ridiculous amounts of money. The problem is, we have... <laughs> no, no, I mean... No, no, no. <laughs> the problem is, we, ha we, we have been teaching a false belief, which ourselves we didn't actually believe. For example, it's like, don't meddle. You're, sh you're serious? The economists didn't believe what they were teaching? They did believe it, and suddenly the, the first pain came, and they gave up their faith very readily. Oh. Do not meddle, governments, you know, arm length, okay. please don't meddle. Come Lehman Brothers, please meddle. Please intervene. We are not self, and we can't regulate ourselves. Uh, please redeem us. Take away our sins as we... You know, and that's what the government did. And that's what the government did. So, because you know, instead of, of God, many sociologists argue that in today's society, you know, government or the society has taken the role of God. And this is sort of, if you substitute these two, that's the role of the creditor of last resort. Last week, European Central Bank became the creditor of, of last resort. So there again, translate that becomes the believer of last resort. In other words, when nobody else believes, you have to believe. And you have to believe ostensibly, much more than everybody else. We will talk later a bit more about the economic teachings of the New and the Old Testament. Let's go to the beginning of your book, in the first chapter, basically in the foreword. Um, you write uh, this sentence. You say, great leaders are foremost creators of stories. Yeah. Um, Explain this a bit. Do you think that everybody who's a storyteller is automatically also a great leader? Or how does this function? Well, and let's, let's take an example from, from how, how myths become facts. Okay? Solus, who was a Greek pre-Socratic philosopher, said a wonderful thing. He said, 
Myth is a something that never happened, but it's happening always. Did you ever meet a homo economicus? No, but then again, everybody is one. No matter what you do, you are homo economicus. But more specifically, what we economists do is we assume, and this sounds very scientific, so when I want to do my little nice models, I have to assume that human beings are rational, self-utility-maximizing -utility individuals, to take an easy case. I assume that, and that's okay. The problem begins when later on... But why do you, excuse me for interrupting you, you have certain reasons to, for assuming that, no? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easier to calculate. Okay. Otherwise, it's impossible. That's the only yeah. okay. This is the only reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's like with the physics, when you want to calculate the free fall of a subject, you assume a stupid thing that there is no friction of air. Of course there is friction of air, thank God, otherwise we would explode okay. immediately. But we just, for, we trick, we make a little trick and say, let's assume, of course we know this is stupid, but for a while, let's assume that there is no friction of air, and alas, hallelujah, the calculation is simpler. It's all because of the calculation. Where the mistake and the fun begins is, you close your work and you go into a pub in the evening, and you meet a friend and you say, you know what I discovered today? That human beings are rational, optimizing egoists. It's like if this physics guy went into the pub later in the day and said, you know what I discovered? Friction of air doesn't exist. So what, there, an assumption, which we know is a technical, stupid assumption, useful but stupid, not real, in the evening actually becomes the truth. Just to demonstrate the point, it's the difference between me saying, let's assume I have 100 million euros, and saying, I have 100 million euros. You immediately feel the difference. One is a myth, a fancy, a fairy tale. Okay. But, and I think this is where we create these myths. This is where we create stories. We actually take our assumptions, and we, create, we make them, we believe in them. So what you're saying is that economists were or are uh, bad psychologists and not so good novelists. Well, they're very they're poor philosophers, in a way, because from an assumption that's technical, they are ready to go into a philosophical debate and actually say, yes, there is no friction of air, because we've proved it, it proved it, it all adds up. Of course, this is, I call this MacGyver economy, you know, MacGyver. He invents a magical solution to everything. And of course, when you shoot these movies, you have to shoot it backwards. Accidentally, there is a scotch tape. Accidentally, there is, you know, I don't know what, some uh, sun is shining and you have a magnifying glass, and accidentally there is a black paper. So it all seems very spontaneous and natural. He just looks around and he takes these things. But of course, it's very meticulously made backwards so that it all looks very spontaneous. This is the way we construct our models but uh, as well. why, why is it that you, uh, they, I think you're still an economist, could get away with this for so many years? How come? Well, because I run very quickly. That's... But all, you know, I, I published the book and, 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 and then I, I, I took it into the theater, so before my critiques had the time to write a proper criticism, I was already for well, a year okay. hidden in the Let's theater. Let's not speak about you, but about the others. The others, I don't know. But, but this has been going on in economics for, for, for many years, but it was always undercurrent. I mean, even Keynes says you can't use mathematics too much. Even Keynes says we fetishized economics. And this is the problem with, uh, with any fetish. And it doesn't work just with economics, it works with morals as well. The, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees was you fetishized ethics. You can do this with ethics, you can do this even with nation. You fetishize a nation, you end up in a war. This is what we've done in Europe many times. Now we've fetishized economics. There's nothing wrong, I think, with economics per se. The problem is that you, you fetishize it, and then it starts controlling you. You know, Jesus' argument against the Pharisees was in a way similar to what the Occupy movement says uh, against economists. You've created a, a structure, a body that's without a soul. It's dry, it's dead, it doesn't serve us, it goes against us. It became a burden. Ethics was always supposed to be an engine. You do ethical things because you are propelled to do so, not that ethics is something that holds you back and you would very much like to, but you can't because you have some moral... So now the economy has become a burden that's controlling us instead of we controlling the economy. Yes, I would argue. And basically, that's what you, over dinner, you, you mentioned, we spoke a bit of Mil Milan Kundera, yeah. you said that's typically for a Milan Kundera story. Yeah. Somebody create a story that then 
the, the creator of this story cannot control the story anymore. Yeah. He's possessed by the... By the it's, it's, I think, the, the subject-object reversal. You see this very often in literature, you see this in myths. We create something that is supposed to serve us, be in our benefit, but it backfires I mean, and it, it maneuvers us into the corner. You can even theologically say that this happened when God created human beings. He created human beings in order to somehow... Amuse have, himself. Yeah, maybe, or to increase his utility. Uh, you know, yes. If, if you, yeah. these, human beings, uh, these human beings backfired. And at the end of the day, one way or another, God maneuvered himself or somehow got maneuvered in the into the position that he had to sacrifice himself. Decrease his utility. Yes. You know, very much. Poor God. Yeah. In a way, this is, this is one way how to read. This often happens with your own creation. This thing repeats itself with us and technology. We've created technology. We've created the system around us. This is the point with, when you, which you see in Matrix. Human beings create technology, something happens, we created technology to slave us. At the end of the day, we are slaves <clears throat> of technology lying there, really just being used for energy purposes. Of, um, I wonder whether this was ecological, but it was actually. It was renewable. But anyway. Um, one of your goals, excuse me for interrupting you, one of your goals is to, to free us from your own, from your own profession. Yeah, I think, I think if you, I mean, there's a nice quote uh, from John Stuart Mill, the one who is only an economist will never be a very good economist. You know, I think this also works for ar artists. You know, if you're only an artist, only an artist, you'll never be a very good artist. If you're only a philosopher, you'll never be a very good philosopher. You actually have to have some, some other input there. But the problem That's is... That's why you want to write a novel. For example, yeah. to, 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 to write a novel. But the, the problem there is that we um, try to make economics a, 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 a physics-like science. Physics is a science that deals with dead objects. And we completely forgot that we are, in a way, part of humanities. And we are not dead. And that we are not yeah. dead, that we're dealing Yet. actually with human beings. Yeah. Another quote from the, from the first, from the, from the foreword. You say... All of economics is, in the end, economics of good and evil. It's the telling of stories by people, of people, to people. Even the most sophisticated mathematical model is de facto a story, a parable, our effort to rationally grasp, grasp the world around us. Um, so even like even a quotation creation is, is, is a myth? Even all it, the mathematics we can find in economics is, are you saying, is yeah. based on myth-making? It's... it's uh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Weintraub, who was uh, a top mathematician and economist of, of the last century, he even went a little further and he said every mathematical model is an autobiography of that particular person or of the age that you live in. S to take an example, you know, we, I think we believe that um, philosophy, psychology, soft skills is sort of an icing on the cake ethics of hard fact economics. I argue exactly the other way around. Mathematical economics is a tip of an iceberg of thousands of years of development and beliefs. And of course, every, every formula you can de deconstruct as this is a mortified thing in which we believe. This is how we be believe we behave. It's like um, a parable, and this is where the problem begins. You know, let's take a, an extreme example of a parable Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Now, what do we mean? We don't exactly mean that he's got yellow fluffy hair, he eats uh, raw meat, and that his average lifespan is nine and a half years. We don't mean this. We mean something different. The problem is if you take this parable and extend it to, to everything. And, and this, I think, is the difference between poetry or literature and, and, and sort, of, um, sort of science. Uh, when I say of a woman, she is like a flower. I can say this, and we can even argue, you can say, no, she's not like a flower. We can even have a fight over it. But scientifically speaking, that's nonsense. I mean, take a flower and a, a female, and they have, come on, nothing in common. I mean, one doesn't produce photosynthesis, the other one doesn't talk. It's just, I mean, are you out of your mind? What do you mean by saying she equals or is like flower? This is nonsense, scientifically speaking. In fact, scientifically speaking, you should compliment your woman like, okay, darling, today you're 97% beautiful. You know, I've seen today only 3% women that are more beautiful than you. 
you know, your nose is 16%, sorry, I must be quite honest there with you, but your hips really make it up because that's 99 on a statistical scale of 5%, you know, statistical significance. <laughs> Somehow, this does not, it never worked for me. So, speaking scientifically. So what you do is you have to be ridiculously poetic, you have to become a liar, and you have to say something like, you know, darling, today you are like a sun rising over a Sahara desert. You Which is a complete nonsense. Of course. You know, so you have, it works. A, you have to be a liar to be in order to be effective. Yes. Yes. And you are saying this is the difference between art and scientists? Yeah. Yeah, we don't understand. Science does not understand that but words don't mean anything by themselves, the context. If in a different culture you said she's like a flower, somebody might hit you. I, I agree, but I think one of the you say in this book that, that scientists should, should uh, study philosophers, religion, myth more better. Yeah, because and otherwise you're producing non -num Let's take a different... And, and also, I mean, if I can finish this sentence, I think you are also saying that a scientist should also be a seducer. He should be seductive also, because otherwise nobody's listening to him. Yes, a storyteller. Yeah, he should be Absolutely. a... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you combine these two things? On the un Perfect. Um, let's take a different... Contrary example to the flower example, and that comes from my favorite scientific novel, which is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. There, the main plot was people were sick and tired of philosophers, artists, and, and poets trying to solve the ultimate question about the meaning of life, universe, and everything, because everybody has its own opinions, and blah, blah, blah. It's very subjective and very fluffy. So what they do is they construct a, a computer of the size of Earth, that is supposed to give an ultimate answer to the ultimate question of meaning of life, universe, and everything. So this computer goes into deep hibernation, says, I understand the question, give me two million years and I will calculate the answer to you. In the meantime, philosophers go on strike because they fear that they would lose their job once this question is resolved. And after these two million years, the computer wakes from his sleep and says, okay, I do have the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. I've QED'd it many times, I've tested it and run through all sorts of filters, and the answer is 42. I think this is what we're doing without philosophy. Because what's the problem with, the, why is it funny? Well, it's again a number, which is what we want. This is sort of what you want. You want a computer to do it, you want it to be objective, you want it to be rational, you want the answer to be number, and you want some very complicated mathematics that nobody understands. This is our idea of the truth. Because we trust mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It Foolish seems me. to be exact. And that's a nice it thing. It seems to be. It, and it is. And, and that's, in a way, the nice thing and the ugly thing also about mathematics. It's exact. And there are so many situations in life where you actually don't want to be exact. Where you actually want to be fuzzy, intentionally. Stupid example. Um, let's imagine that you are a lady. Yes. For a while. For a while, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, and I take you out for drink. Yes. Uh, the nice thing about economics, I can assume that you will not say no. And we're sitting in the bar, and uh, I say, darling, what would you like to have? And you said, I'd like to have a glass of red wine. I said, wonderful, here's eight euros. Exactly. You then would get insulted. Absolutely. And I would say, well, what's the problem? if I give the eight euros to you or if I give it to the, to the waiter. Well, the problem is that I showed in an inappropriate relationship because our relationship is not supposed to be quid for quid. It's not supposed to be exact. That's why when you give a gift, you take out the, the, the price tag because that's what's insulting but, about it. But you it. go too fast. I want to speak later about gifts, but okay. Okay, but, sorry. Um, we come back to gifts. Yeah. First, because the first the gifts belong to your chapter about Christianity. Yeah. yeah, very much. And you start the first, the oldest story in the world, according to this book, is Gilgamesh. Yes. You start, and one of the one of the things you say about this, maybe it's if people don't know the story, it's it's not necessary to retell the whole story. But one of the things that's important in the story is the difference between nature and the city. In this story, it's the nature. Evil is very much nature. Yes. And the city is where is the good place. Yes. And later in the Old Testament, we will see that's completely opposite. So can you comment a bit on this? Why is this so? Because you, it's a few, few paragraphs you, divide, you devote to this theme. Why is it so important for you? Why is this so interesting? It's an interesting question for me because uh, I, you, one needs to answer, ask the question, the nature of man. Is man good by nature, in the state of nature, or does he need to be civilized 
denaturalized, so to speak, for him to become, become, become good. Is goodness a product of civilization, or is civilization what's actually causing in harm, harm and evil? And um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it was the city that produced good, and and natural state of things was evil, something that needed to be uh, something that needed to be tamed. Um, natural state is not presented as a state of harmony, which you see, for example, in the Old Testament, even in the Greek myths. Um, the Garden of Eden, and even before Prometheus gives his dubious gifts to mankind of Techni, we lived in ignorance. Also, Adam and Eve lived in some sort of moral ignorance. They didn't know the difference because, between yeah. good and evil. That's very important. Yeah, they didn't know the difference. So and that's why, why they were good. That's why they, they, were, they lived in bliss, in they a state did, of bliss. They lived in bliss, they were ignorant. They were ignorant. Um, also, uh, Enkidu, who is, who is sort of a brute animal, that gets transformed into a human being in the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's a very interesting quote in, in one of the, one of the um, um, stones, or plateaus. Um, it says, um, Enkidu gained reason, but animals ran away from him. So he lost this sort of harmony with nature, this is a one-way process, by gaining reason and understanding. Also in the Greek, mythology, people lived in some sort of ignorant harmony, and uh, Prometheus gives them techni, fire, technology, okay. knowledge. This angered gods, and, Very much. and, and they send Pandora as, as, as a punishment. And that punished also Prometheus. So it's an interesting thing that some sort of progress is the beginning of, 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 of culture, but also, even in the old stories, this is something that we, in a way, regret opening. The Pandora box should have been closed. But also, in, in the first, in, in Gilgamesh, there is no progress. Everything, in the end, everything starts where it begins. There's yes. no progress in an idea that comes much later. And even evil wasn't moral, so to speak. When evil things happen, it wasn't anybody's blame. Today, if a tree falls on a bear in a forest, we don't look for morality. It just happened. If that tree falls on a human being, we immediately look for guilt. Whose fault was, was it? Mm -hmm. Was it his fault? Was it fault of the, um, uh, of the gardener? Or was it the fault of God's? Why? Uh, so we have, or Hebrews have given good and bad a moral side to it. Even Hebrews interpret history as a result of morality. Something happens, good or evil, and then a historical, historical reaction is a, is a consequence. This is quite interesting, and this is something that we are still battling with in, in the economy today. Still in the chapter about Gilgamesh, uh, you write something that Michael Novick said, an economist also, a colleague of yours, and you write, uh, Michael Novick argues that only democratic capitalism, as opposed to alternative frequently utopian systems, understood how deeply evil nature is rooted in the human soul and realized that it is beyond any system to uproot this deeply embedded sin. And I think you, you, you agree with him, that it's only democratic capitalism that... Or it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, because there he has very many, 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 many things there. First of all, the, the quote that human nature is by, by nature evil is something that is more of, uh, of, of the Babylonian Times. pagan tradition. In the Hebrew, especially in the Old Testament, human beings were created good, and the core is still good. The nature actually is good, and we got spoiled by cities. Sodom and Gomorrah, okay. Babylon, it, that's where evil happens. So culture was not something that we looked up to. Progress was not something that we look up to, but it's something that actually deteriorates human beings. Even in the New Testament, you don't have this idea of salvation as a progress, but it's more salvation as a return. You know, even metanoia, repentance, means return. You know, go back to yourself, not go forward to yourself, but go back to the, to the original. But to the still original. to this day, the idea of the, the city as being the, being the center of evil is highly popular yeah. among the Taliban, but also yeah. among Christians, among yes. religious people. Yes. And even today, when you know, if, you, if you have these spiritual people say, you know, we should slow down, means that we're not going in the right direction. You know? so, so this whole idea of progress, which of course is a fundamental thing for economics in terms of GDP growth, you get from, from sort of the, the soft part of arts and religion is to 
slow, you know, the role of art is people to stop and think, mm -hmm. you know. So, in other words, the contrary to that is not to stop and continue, and that's supposed to be bad. You're supposed to contemplate, stop, think, maybe go back a couple of steps. So we have this in our mentality, and what intrigues me is, where does this come from? Come from? One more quote from uh, the chapter about Gilgamesh, um, from the last pages. The less a civilized city person is dependent on nature, the more he or she is dependent on the rest of society. Like Enkidu, we have exchanged nature for society. Harmony with incalculable nature for harmony with man. Do you think this is a wise exchange? Or do you think it's unavoidable to... Sp we, we cannot go back, so we have to accept it, whether we like it, it or not. We're, we're not dependent... Uh we're not dependent on the whims of, of nature. This room will always have 22 degrees, whether it's raining out there or if it's heat or, or cold, it will be constant temperature here. This is the result of civilization. We are independent of what's happening outside. It can be snowing, it, whatever, we don't care. It's but we think we are. It yeah, might be an illusion. But, but as long as, as, long, as, as, long long as, as the no society earthquakes. works, yeah. we're fine. So we are very independent of the nature, but we have become extremely dependent on the rest of the society. None of us can find the source of fresh water, I think. Uh, so we are dependent, even on water, on a specialized society. I specialize on a small little tiny fraction of whatever. You also, you do a small thing. And in exchange, the society closes me. And I didn't put this together, and I even don't know how to do it. In fact, I don't know who did it, and I don't care who did it. I consider it my own, and it is properly my own. But the thing is, I'm dependent on my clothing, on my fooding, and on everything, on my entertainment, on the rest oh, of the society. Mm -hmm. So we believe in this fundamental freedom and independence, but yet, in fact, we are more dependent on others than ever before. before. We are actually very strong as a society, but very weak as individuals. In the state of nature, I would die in, 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 in two days with my economic teaching. I mean, come on. But this specialization is also the, the source of our wealth. Yes. Yes. But that wealth isn't properly yours. It's, your wealth is wealthy only in the society that has sort of produced it or respected it. Your iPhone and my iPhone, or, or I mean, sorry, my... Uh, your Samsung, Samsung, Samsung just, yeah, your exactly. Samsung, yeah, so, yeah. Um, uh, is useless in, in sub-Saharan Amazonia. It only makes sense in, uh, in, in the state of nature. I mean, in, 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 the, city. Of in, in yeah. the city, in society. Yeah. And even values. I mean, chair has only value in a society. If you see a chair in the jungle, that chair has no meaning. The only conclusion you can draw from it, some human being must have left it here or dropped it from the plane, but in, it doesn't have a meaning in its own self. It only has a meaning for us to sit upon. Tree has a purpose of its own, um, and so do animals. But the things that we meddle with, and we actually we use a lot of violence. I mean, this tree is a product of, of a lot of violence. Of violence? Of violence, yeah. I mean, we took a tree, we took out of the earth um, stones, we made it into iron, tortured it with high heat temperatures, made it into a saw, cut the tree, dried it on the sun, you know, forced it into shapes that's not natural for it. And this, I think, is the topic of horrors, that this chain of uh, order of events reverses, that nature suddenly starts applying these things Class. in a reverse manner. Take, I don't know, the, the very simple Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I don't know, is it... It's, I don't know, it's, it might it be you, be yes. Yeah. It might be you, yeah. Be let's, let's solve it. I, is it yeah. okay? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, but then again, nobody can hear me. But that's maybe better. I don't know. We can, yeah, I can hear you. That's fine. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. The, the nature, usually in a, in a form of a madman or a child, they don't have rationality, or animals. Oh, now he's coming. So to somebody comes I didn't to do fix anything. it. Yeah. So that's another example of a specialist doing what you cannot do. No, I can't even speak with that. No. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, nature starts reversing this, this flow of events, and it starts attacking us in the same way that we've been attacking it. Um, this, I think, is this primordial fear that we still have. Taking yes. a chainsaw, 
Nature takes a chainsaw and uses it on us. Well, the whole, whole debate about climate change is an example. Yeah, I like here the green sort of be nice to nature because nature is very nice and it's very romantic, but if you misbehave, it will kill you. So, I, that's nice. So basically, it's, it's an act of uh, selfishness to be good to nature. We, are, we must be good to nature in order to preserve ourselves. And, and the future. And the future. Yeah. Let's go to the Old Testament, because then things are starting to change. History becomes like, uh, it's, it's not a repetition, but it's headed towards something. Um, and according to you in this book, this is also where the idea of economic growth starts. You write, this is why we must constantly grow, because we deep down and often implicitly believe that we are headed toward an economic paradise on earth. Because care for the soul has today been replaced by care for external things. As the Czech philosopher Jan Potocka writes, economists have become key figures of great importance in our time. Yeah, uh, I think, see, I'm doing it again, I must be... Yes, this is... Okay, it's better. That's, it's better. Yeah. Don't move too much. Don't move. Okay, that's uh, easy for yeah. you to say. That's <laughs> 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 um, uh, see how it controls me? Yes. Yeah. You did it on purpose to make your point. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I just put it on the table. Yes, let's so do it. So everybody yeah. see this is artificial. It's yeah. not my voice. What if I just keep it there? is in the ear. Look. This is when I touch this, you know? But then you also move your face. Oh, I do? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm not allowed to move my face. That's, that's tough. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, also put it here. <laughs> <laughs> While you're at it. That's it's a whole operation. Yeah, it's a whole operation. Yeah. It's, look, I'm not moving my face. It's, uh, see? Uh -huh. Maybe you should employ me as a technician. <laughs> I can scream. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Good. So I'll just scream for a little while and then, then, uh, then I won't. What was the question? <laughs> The question about the Old Testament, when things, uh, I just quoted you and uh, you basically say that the idea of economic growth started in the Old Testament and then you quote Jan Potocka, yeah. a philosopher who says that, that economists have become key figures I of our times. Yeah. In the Old Testament, the notion of heaven isn't as developed as in, in the New Testament. In fact, if you just read the Old Testament, almost nothing uh, happens in... Uh, in uh, Heaven doesn't really exist. The only thing you get to do, if you're good, and I don't really get what's funny about it, is you get to meet all your ancestors. Which, you know... <laughs> Could you be fun. spend a weekend with your ancestors? <laughs> you don't really want to do that for eternity. No. But anyway, that was, the, uh, that was the only... You go to your forefathers and foremothers. And... But otherwise, hell wasn't developed. Pretty much, Earth was a responsibility of human beings. We were here to sort of make uh, the ends meet and sort of make the place here livable. Christianity later sort of reversed this, and it's, you know, the time here on Earth, survive it, uh, you will suffer, but That's, in exchange yeah. you will get a nice little uh, mansion in heaven. And it's not real life, this is like basically just uh, an appetizer. An appetizer, exactly. <laughs> But in, but, in, but in the Old Testament, what happened on earth, happened on earth. That's why they had such a problem with God being just or not. The economics of good and evil, uh, the question why can bad things happen to good people, was a fundamental question for, for, um, for, for the Old Testament Jewish religion, because it all happened here on earth. Christianity then solved this big riddle by saying, of course, God is just, not here, but in the afterlife. So if you get bad things here, but you behave well, and you get bad reward, you will be rewarded afterwards. afterwards. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's a nice solution, I think. Only it made us sacrifice the whole world. The whole world then became an evil place where you just sort of have to survive, but really just try and pretend it's not real because it isn't. 
the real thing comes later. Do you, do you believe we still suffer from this idea? Yeah, I think the book of Job, I mean, we still, I think here, we, uh, we believe that good and evil are, in absolute terms, equal. I mean, a good deed plus the equally bad deed end up in a zero. Uh, it's, you know, if you put the absolute number... It's again mathematics. It's again mathematics. So this is a dualistic idea that we had from, from other religions, dualistic religions, whereas Christianity, whereas Christianity uh, has an absolute victory of good over evil. I mean, God is an ontologically different being than the devil. They're not the same, same, same power, to the same caliber. God is above, and evil is yeah. sort of a servant, even if you want, the creation of, of God, God, the devil, exactly. So there, it was much more, much more, much more complicated. The economy of good and evil, which is the question that the Book of Job answers: Is there an economy of good and evil? If I'm good. Will I get a reward? And the whole book of Job says, well, not necessarily. No. You have to do good, not for the re reward, but for goodness itself. itself. For the love of the law. For the love of uh, goodness. Goodness. Goodness is supposed to be self-rewarding. You do good because it's good. You do evil not because it's evil, but because you see some good. You steal not because you want to steal, but because you want to be richer. So there's nothing wrong with being richer. Or you steal because you want some excitement. There is not, nothing wrong with excitement. But evil needs a good end for usage, whereas goodness does not need any alternative yeah. end. You simply do something as for the same of goodness. Theory. But in, in your chapter on the Old Testament, um, you make it sound as if being good, as if there's a connection between what you call outcoming good versus incoming good. Because you, you write, for the, for the Hebrews, morals meant the best investment they could make. And also, uh, you say for the Hebrews, history proceeds according to how morally its actors behave. So there is a connection there according, um, between the outcoming good and the incoming good. Yeah. Yeah. That's an investment. If I, if I behave well, I invest in my future. Right, right. If the kings misbehave, then the nation gets that gets hurt, whereas if the law is kept, the widow is taken care of, and the I don't know the, the fatherless orphans, then that nation will prosper. Uh, and there is a huge stream of that in the Old Testament. And there is also an opposite, which is, for example, the Book of Job, which says you know it doesn't really work that simple. Even in the Psalms, you read David, the alleged author of, of these Psalms. You know how come the rain falls on the just? and the unjust alike, which again you can bring to the debate today. Are Greeks to be blamed for their downfall? Can we, who shall we blame that the system has collapsed? Why are we blaming the Greeks, not blaming the... The bankers, Irish? or the bankers who lent the money. Or even the artists. You know, this is, uh, I, I think I can say this, you know, I, I, I'm a big friend of, of the artist community in Czech Republic, and they often, you know, when we, we're, we're having these debates, and they say, you know, economists, you are responsible for the mess that we are in. And I say, absolutely, yes, but we're not in it together because who creates a consumer society? Who creates adverts? Well, the last that I checked, it was creatives, artists. Artists are the ones who create, and this is no blame. They're the evil ones. No, no, no. no? We're in it all together. This is the problem with, set, uh, with specialization, you know? Yeah. The specialization, which is the key of our wealth, is specialization. In a specialized society, you can divide value added and, and uh, uh, to any. That's why we can tax it. Value added tax. It's very easy to say how much how value you've added. But when it comes to people, so you can divide labor. Division of labor works very well. Division of value also. But the division of guilt doesn't. You don't know who's guilty. If I kill a person, I will go. I will be sentenced for 42, to stick to the number 42, 42 years. If we kill him together, it's not like you get 21 years and I get 21 no. years. And if we kill 42 people, we kill a person, each one gets a year. It doesn't work that way. It multiplies. So guilt, you get 42 and I get 42. So guilt multiplies in specialization, so to speak. So, um, I don't know, the movie The Cube, if you've seen, or this I think is even um, uh, Kafka's topic. 
I got into a situation, I don't know who caused it, I don't know why, I'm looking for some sort of explanation, some sort of reason in it, but it's never really given. And in this movie, The Cube, which is sort of a horror movie, I think six people end up in this cube that sort of kills them and uh, tortures them. At the end of the movie, they discover it was actually them who constructed this cube. Each one was doing a small little detail until they constructed this monstrous torturing device. This, I think, is, is how we should look on ourselves. We're, we're all in it. Adverts are created by artists, psychologists, and sociologists. The soft side. And this is, this is, uh, this is, um, uh, this is the problem. It's not easy to, this is not an economic problem in, alone. Of course it's an economic problem, but we've been all it's sort of a simple structure in which everybody contributes to the best of his knowledge, and it's very nice that somebody creates a very nice advert, but at the end of the day, what you're serving is you're trying to convince people to buy something that they didn't need, mm. otherwise you wouldn't need the advert. Are you saying that we should not blame the bankers or the, the Greek people for the crisis in Greece, but we should blame ourselves? Yeah, I mean, of course we should blame the bankers. As well, Absolutely yeah. As well. But it's not as simple as that. It's, 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 we're all in it together. <laughs> and then since you, since you asked the question a few times um, about forgiveness... This is why I was not a model. <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> um, going back to the, to the question of forgiveness uh, and, and, and Greece, uh, you asked the question a few times, but you haven't answered the question yet. Uh, should we forgive? Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. Even even though it goes against our um, our belief in the in the law, belief that never worked. That never worked. It's a system that never worked, and it needs to be. And this even in law today, we need the institution of grace and the institution okay. of forgiveness. Simply, our laws are not very good. They don't work in hundred percent of the cases. The system doesn't work. It's it's it looks it's very hard and exact, but in fact it isn't. Uh, laws don't work very well. Uh, so there has to be a buffer zone. And, you know, this is a beautiful thing about economy. Two generations ago, Ireland was the... the booming. The sick man of, 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 of Europe. Irish oh, people were... It was, it was already booming then, no? But two generations ago. Oh, two no, generations. Sorry, sorry. Oh, two, I thought two, two decades. Oh, no, excuse sorry. me. Two generations yes. ago, it was a, a poor, God-forsaken country, and it just... Uh, that's the way it was. And... Um, <laughs> Now they are the richest, except for Luxembourg, the richest uh, country in, 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 in Europe. Most productive, most, most beautiful, and everything. The United Kingdom was a sick man of Europe before Thatcher came. I mean, uh, Germany in the 18th, uh, 1800s was a sick... I mean, 20 years ago, Czech Republic, I mean, we were drinking Coke as if it was a nectar of gods. It was, it was something... I remember... Uh, this was during the communist regime, and I had, I think I had birthday or something, and my uncle brought from somewhere a bottle of Coke, real bottle of real Coke. And I poured it in the glass, and I started voraciously drinking it, and he hit me in the head, and he said, you don't drink it like that. Drink, if you're thirsty, drink water, and then just sip it, you know, as a sort of a dessert uh, version of, of, of drinking. Now Coke is... You know, it's water. It, it's water. Yeah. It's actually, the, it's actually, Coke is very democratic because you know the queen is drinking the same Coke, Coke like the poorest person. Um, you know, with wine is different because there you can have really expensive wines. Wine. Yeah. But what There's do you no do if you want a luxury Coke? Coke no. You know, you, it's nothing. a very communist drink. You know, uh, in a way, yeah. everybody gets to do the gets to, so. <laughs> you shouldn't criticize uh, Coke, it from the right. You know, the left shouldn't criticize Coke. Coke. They should actually. This is our... They should criticize the winemakers. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah exactly. Yeah. They should criticize, criticize wine. It exactly. happened to me during the revolution, sorry. We had, in, in 2000, we had this globalization protest in Prague, and they, for some reason, they don't like McDonald's. And for some reason, I just walked out of McDonald's with a che che fresh Cheese cheeseburger <laughs> in my hands, meeting 20 of these anarchists. So they started very fiercely explaining to me that they're against globalization, and this is a globalization product, and they wanted to, I think they wanted to beat me up. Yes. Luckily there, I'm an intellectual, so I immediately ask the person, wait, I can't, sorry, 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 just a second, you, you're listening to music, no, you have earphones. They say, yes, I do, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? I say, oh, do you listen to traditional Czech music? Or maybe you have some globalization, American U2 maybe, or 
Pink Floyd or Clash or something. So why can you do globalization, you know, in your ears and I can't have uh, in my and, stomach and, and, and in my stomach? Yeah. So I think they That's didn't beat me up, but you have to really. So sometimes you have to be this, sharp the, in order the, not this to be. gobbledygooking can yeah. save you from being beaten. But uh, let's before we speak more maybe about coke. Uh, let's go back to forgiveness because also in your chapter on the Old Testament you mentioned that back then in the Old Testament it's written that every 49th year all debts. All debts, debts should be forgiven. The yes. 49th year is a special year, and everyone is set free. To, we, we start from, from yes. scratch. The year of Jubilee. It's a yeah. little bit like Jubilee. when you play Monopoly. The whole idea is you play a game. Actually, notice how Monopoly is, again, a communist game. In the beginning, everybody has the same chances. <laughs> it's a perfectly communist game. You get the same amount of money, and the dice is fair. So every game, even the dice is fair. That's interesting. The dice should. I mean, it's not tilted. Yeah. It, it, it's the, because coincidence fair is in fair. Its being, fair in its uh, okay. Let's uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You have the same chance of hitting yeah. a six like I do. Okay. Okay. Every game starts in a communist manner. We have same chances, and as we play the game, one wins. Mm -hmm. What do we do at the end of the game? We say congratulations, Arnon. You're the man. You won. Shall we play another game? And you say, of course, let's play another game. You return the money back, we shake the cards, and we start again from a communist. And this time you win. And this time perhaps I win. Now let's imagine, this is of course a gross simplification, but I think you, you get my point. Let's imagine that you know, this is the way you live your life. You play a game when you're 18, and the way you end up in this game is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. So if you are the Lord, you are the winner, I will be serving and cleaning your uh, shoes mm -hmm. for the rest of because life. you won, yeah, I because won. of life. Yeah. So this is, of course, an extreme uh, fancy, yeah. but I think this is what the institution of the year of Jubilee was supposed to do. Once in 49 years said, okay, it was a very nice game, thank you very much, now let's, let's put the money back into the box, shake it, and let's start, let's start again. Should Which, we go back to this tradition? Could uh, we go back to this tradition? Well, yes. Uh, it's, it's such a different culture that it's very difficult to say so, but in a way, we are somehow doing this. Not in a fair way. Explain. How, how well, we banks, for example, or forgiven. financial institutions are forgiven. Greece is forgiven partially. Um, Ireland also. Hungary also, so that we don't you know, pick, on, pick on Greece alone. Um, and this happens. So one way how you could put this is that the crisis is an enforced year of jubilee, an enforced Shabbat. The nature is tired, technology is tired, human resources, you know, human beings are tired. are tired. We need a rest. Yeah. We don't want to rest, but it's somehow like a burnout syndrome. It just, it just forces you to rest. We're very angry about the fact that we can't work 24-7, but that's the way, that's the way it is. And it, part of that is forgiveness of debts. Do we want to do it? No, we don't want to do it, but it's happening anyway in a, a chaotic manner. So in the Old Testament, you can even go, of course, this is, I think this is a little bit going over the top, but I will do it anyway. It was, it was uh, the collapse was uh, expected. The we collapse. expect every Lehman? 49 years the system oh, to collapse. Mean in the Old Testament, the collapse. In the Old Testament. Correct. The system is not, it's not a very good system in long time. It works for a little while, but every 20, 49 years it needs to be reset. Set. Like, you know, when you have windows, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to once in a while yeah, reset. The reset. Whole, yeah. In fact, you shouldn't complain that you're resetting your windows so often because this is the only point where you're actually a little bit more clever than your computer. I enjoyed the resetting very much because for a second there when it goes black, I feel superior to my computer. computer. And then, of course, all the programs come back. So you need to do this with every, with every system. The Old Testament somehow knew it. The system needs to be reset uh, every now and then. We thought it's actually a very good long-term system, but even our system gets reset by the wars, by crises, by some sort of revolutions in, 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 monetary, uh, in monetary meaning, etc. Even the theoretical economics, we know these Kuznets cycles, which actually take 49, 50 to 60 years. So you can observe this sort of a behavior uh, even in, in, in today's scientific um, discourse. So this is a moment of resetting the system. In a way, yes, this is the, this is the task at hand. 
We thought the system is perfect. Now we know that it isn't perfect. It's, it's actually very good, by and large. But we want it to be better. We need to reset it. And um, in this way, Greece is not behind us. Like we always say, you know, Greece it's is... It's ahead of us. It's ahead of us, yeah. 20 years ahead of us, I would say. Like always in history, Greeks were always, always a little bit ahead, ahead of us. Of. Now they've bankrupted 20 years before of, the rest before of us. Before we do. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good we should be very grateful. Thank you for the case that's study. That's a nice prediction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, go, we come to ancient Greece in a minute. One more quote from your, your chapter on the, the Old Testament. It's about money and it's about belief. There you write, uh, money is a matter of belief, even faith. This is nicely expressed by the Czech term for lender, veritel. Veritel. Ver veritel. Believer. Believer. Literally meaning believer. It's someone who believes the debtor. Yeah. Um, if it's just a matter of belief, if it's nothing more than that, why can't we print more money to, um, to solve problems? If it's it all interesting, Arvind, why you say that it's nothing more than a belief. Well, of course... Belief is very, very... Big. Very big. It's not... By saying that money is a belief, I'm not putting it down. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you only believe... I don't have any money on me, but... Um, I have money on me. You want some okay, money? Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there you go. Ten euros. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so this, of course, is a very nice, unoriginal piece of paper. Um, the only way... And you can see all the holy symbols that we, that we have on it, not on the European, but on the national ones. We had, you know, our Hitler Kings and, and all the, the holy God symbols of the, the government. The US dollar has got on yeah. it. So. Uh, why? Well, this needs to invoke trust. The only reason why these papers work is that we trust them. I work my days so that I get this, and then I go to a supermarket and I ask for uh, lunch, and that lady gives me a lunch for this. You know, just imagine the lady says, what is this? <laughs> I don't believe. <laughs> you know, you can shove it up your anything. Yeah. I don't believe, I don't, why should I do, uh, cook you a lunch out of my own eggs and my own bread that I've baked the whole day for a piece of paper? Well, the only reason she will do it is that she believes that somebody else will believe if she comes to you, she can buy your book, for example, almost. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's an agreed faith system. There is really nothing behind it, and you can see that well with the credit card. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Credit card is, uh, that's even more abstract. That's some magnetic, somewhere, I don't plastic. even... Plastic. Pla well, yeah, pl plastic symbol, and I'm sending you energy buy it. I know it's sort of, if, you, uh, if I think a medieval shaman would <laughs> see this, he would immediately know that there's some magic going on. Of course. Because yes. I'm sending you energy, <laughs> and I'm using, and I do it long distance, and I'm using a magic word that only I know. <laughs> so, you know. And this word are the numbers of your... American and this Express. word has a number. Yes. Yeah. This, I think, is also one of the... Uh, this is, of course, a little bit uh, funny, but you know, theologians have been debating for ages the meaning of the word 666. You know, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean the internet? Does it mean... To me, the scary thing is that it is a person whose name is a number. And that alone is... It's is the beast. Is the beast. That's, yeah. that's scary, that it's a person who thinks in numbers, who is a number. Um, a Polish sociologist, Zygmunt Bauman, said, you know, in his Modernity and Holocaust, he said, you know, Holocaust was not an oops of modernity. Holocaust was a direct result of rationality deprived of fellow emotions. So we have these sins of emotions. We get drunk and we beat up somebody or we sleep with somebody who we're not supposed to. That is a sin of emotion. But we also have sins of rationality, which we sort of don't know about. And these sins of rationality are much more evil than the sins of emotions. Because if you really want to wipe out a nation, if you really want to start a war proper, first of all, you have to be sober. You know, I wish all these evil leaders would be much more of a drunkard. Drunk. Because if you have a bone to pick with the Jew, go into a pub and have a fist fight. Bad enough. But at least you will not be able to start a war. For that, you have to be 
sober, you have to have a PR plan, you have to have an agency in order to create an evil of that magnitude. You have to be extremely rational in order to do that. So we have to be, of course, careful of the sins of emotion, but much more careful here of the sins of uh, rational, scientific, manufactured evil yep. resulting in, for example, the Holocaust. Yep. At the beginning of the evening, at the beginning of the evening, you spoke a bit about the gifts. I think now it's a good time because you mentioned the, the faith, the belief, how important it is in money. Before money, uh, and also you quote David Graeber, yeah. um, an anthropologist who wrote a beautiful book, uh, Debt, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. Uh, before, basically, the, the first uh, societies were gift exchanging societies. Yeah. And also, you, you write that for an economist, the gift is something very complicated. He yeah. doesn't know how to deal with the gift. Yeah. This is so how, how, did, how did we get from the gift economy that I need something, you give it to me, and basically also the first money was only used for enemies, if I'm, if I'm right. It was for enemies or outsiders. Yeah. enemies and Not religion. Between, between in, in the community itself, there was no money. Yeah. We didn't need any money. Yeah. So how did we get from the, from the gift economy to the money economy? This is, something that, yeah, sorry. No? This is yeah. something that David Graeber, I think, explains very well. And, but I would also demonstrate uh, one additional point. Uh, you know, the way we teach economics is we teach for three, four years, we teach an artificial system which uh, we teach our students, this is the way it works. Human beings are rational, they care about their own utility, they, don't, they are exact and they like to weigh pros and cons and, and, and they think about everything they do. And then after four years, we show them paradoxes. So gifts is a paradox. How come I tip in a restaurant that I will never return to. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Reserve Your Dogs from, from Quentin Tarantino. In the beginning, there's this beautiful um, quarrel about whether they should tip or not. The funny part is, you know, giving gifts is, is no paradox. Everybody understands how it works. It's a paradox only to economists taught for three years uh, that this is the way human mm. beings yeah. behave. Uh, how did we get there? Well. In the beginning, it seems that it all functioned. You know, these gift economies are still among us, by the way. It looks like they've died away, but gift economies still work. And that's, for example, the realm of friendship or the realm of uh, family. There, exchange does not work. I mean, your son or your daughter paints you a very, I mean, objectively ugly painting. And for that, you feed him for a year, but it's not a good deal. I mean, the market value of that painting is nothing. Thanks. You can't really sell it. It has value for you, of course, but that's about it. Maybe your grandmother, but... <laughs> You're feeding the kid with real value, with real money. I mean, this is not an exchange. I mean, of course, one of my, some of my most radical friends will go out to say that we are trading cuteness. You know, the baby is cute, yeah. and I pay him by food. You know, I think or, this or is... Or maybe you, you can know. put it, you have a son, maybe when you are old and needy, your son will take care of you. Yeah, you think so? I, mm, I, don't, I don't know your son. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Looking at myself, uh, it was not a very good investment for my parents. Okay. But, um, uh, <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's, it, I think it works. I mean, my parents, or you do it to your children in the hope that uh, their children will do it to their yeah. children. And that I do pretty well. My parents had two children. I only have one, so I'm still... On, on the, the winning side of, of, if I look at it economically, but of yeah. course, we never do. But anyway, your point with, with, with gifts is, again, human relationships, when they are personal, they don't want to be exact. It, it doesn't function if it's, if it's exact. Um, That's why I don't accept eight euros when you buy me a drink, but I accept the beer or the wine. Exactly. Or if I ask you, could you please, I'm moving, could you please help me buy the, uh, move the couch? Of course, you will come, you will help me. And then I say, well, thank you, Arnon, very much. So that was two and a half hours. What's your average? You know, this is 53 euros for you. Well, it's not, not enough. Yes. You, you want 70? Yeah. So this is ridiculous. But if I take you out for a beer and it will cost me 70 euros, then that's, that's fine. And that's the way we like it to be. Of course, we exchange. But it must be fuzzy. It mustn't be exact. The moment it starts being exact... It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work. It, it crumbles. I am insulting you by making you a business partner instead of, instead of a friend. And, and there, you have to be very careful by not breaching 
these limits. Dan Ariely has a very good example. You have a girlfriend. Try leaving 200 euros when you leave the room uh, on, 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 on the table. By accident. I mean, By this is a huge course. insult. These two, <laughs> these two <laughs> things you mustn't, yeah. you mustn't um, breach. The no. funny thing is, everybody knows these rules very well. Everybody knows exactly where you're supposed to ask for money and where you're not, when you're not supposed to ask for money. And um, so these gift economies are very functional till today. This is why we don't have, for example, the crisis of friendship. Nobody's complaining about the crisis of friendship because it works very well. There is not a single law in any known uh, legal system that guarantees how friends should behave to each other, that they shouldn't come too late and that, that you, you, know, you should pay for my drink and I should pay for your drink and we should have it pretty much. There is no law, nothing, but it works. Why? Because where there is love, you don't need laws. But where there is no love, which happens with strangers, there you need, there you need laws. So the, these gift economies, the way it works between friends, the way it works in, in a family, that's the way, Graeber argues, it worked in these primitive Ancient, yeah. societies in the past. It was redistribution, um, not of communist manner, but of communitarian manner. The way the families function today, um, they've, larger societies, of course, never as big as ours, functioned in the past. Money was something that people used very rarely, really, just to buy salt and to pay, to pay taxes and to deal with strangers. I think that's also a point that you're making in your book uh, when you write, in life there are simply areas that are holy and in which it's not allowed to economize, rationalize or maximize efficiency. Yeah, in friendship and, for and, example. Yeah. And you are a very efficient friend. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. But isn't isn't this what's happening too much? Isn't, you, you said that there is no crisis in friendship, but I would say that many people feel differently. That, that they feel that, that everything, even friendship or time, should be efficient. E, well, then, I, I don't know. You know. Do you ask yourself a question, is my partnership efficient? Is my family efficient? You ask if it's good or bad, but not efficient. Um, Chesterton has this nice thing, he says, you know, only the person who really doesn't have anything bigger to care about cares about efficiency. If you're running somewhere, you're not really thinking whether you're running in the most efficient way. You have a goal to go and, 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 and you're doing it. Efficiency, as a maxim of our society, is a strange thing. And also... But all the managers talk about efficiency, as you know. So this is a big mistake. Uh, yeah, but the they also, they also yeah? know that things work better if they're not fully efficient. Let's take a stupid example, um, New York and the Central Park. New York, as you know, is a mecca of efficiency. Every millimeter is up in the sky, down to earth, utilized so that you can have as much GDP creation as possible. Yet, in the middle of New York, you have a Central Park, which is very inefficient. Beautiful. It's but beautiful and very inefficient, and that's perhaps why it's there. I mean, of course, if we build new skyscrapers and insurance companies and whatnot, GDP would, would probably increase and the city would be more efficient, but we don't want it that way because we know that in the long run there needs to be some sort of a Shabbat in this efficiency, so a, a spatial Shabbat, so to speak, where it's actually inefficient. I and it works better if it's not efficient. I once spoke to a venture capitalist and he told me that every firm should have at least 20% of inefficient workers. That was, that was good for the firm. That's your point. Also, the worker can be inefficient, like yeah. a Shabbat among the... Yeah. Yes. I don't know how they calculate it, but yes, That's, that sounds good. Huh. <laughs> One more question before we go to Christianity, also because we discussed this briefly uh, during dinner. Um, you write in, in your chapter in the Old Testament, the influence of Jewish thought on the development of the market democracy cannot be overestimated. And on, the, on your German Wikipedia page, you are attacked for quoting uh, an economist, I believe. Zombard, Zombard. no, he was... He was uh, Sociologist, sort of. Sociologist for not mentioning his anti-Semitic um, articles or remarks. But isn't this 
on a more serious level, because isn't this also like a cliche of the Jew, like the inventor of capitalism? Yeah, Thank you. and my point there exactly is that every thinker had it different, you know, that uh, Max Weber said it's the Calvinist Protestant ethics that brought okay. capitalism. Um, Michael Novak says, no, it's the Catholic ethic, and Zombard, for example, said, no, it's the it's Jewish Jew. Old Testament. So I was really saying, okay. It's all three of them. All three of them, pick one. I could argue that it was... I don't know, the Epic of Gilgamesh, if I, if I, if I really want to. No. But, um, but it was interesting because, I mean, if you... I mean, I'm half Jewish, and uh, this isn't really a discourse in the Czech Republic. Nobody's looking at Zombard that way. I mean, Mart am I allowed to quote Martin Heidegger, who was dubiously um, supporting? Uh, am I allowed to quote Fra uh, Nietzsche? Uh, but I understand this, and I respect it, only I didn't know it's such a sensitive thing in Germany. If you want to quote Marx in Czech Republic, you need to be very careful, and especially when you quote Lenin or Stalin, you have to be very, very careful. But in, in the English-speaking world, you can quote Marx, you know, without blamelessly without yeah. actually saying that he was a bad guy or, you know, something. Yeah. So, so this is, I'm quite sorry that, that I, you know, that the German um, publisher didn't say this is a sensitive topic, you should say that. But I, really, I even quote direct Nazis in, in, in the book saying that, you know, van ich den Kaiser war, if I was a, was, a, was a Caesar, that was a part of the anti-Jewish propaganda in which they used exactly this article, you know, Jews are responsible for capitalism, that's why. And you can actually see a lot of that even in the zeitgeist. I don't know if you've seen it on Wikipedia. There in between the lies, lines, you can even read sort of, you know, it's this secret... Um, uh, what have you, Secret banker, conspiracy. conspiracy, sort of... I read a little bit of anti-Semitism, a lot of anti-Semitism in that. There's some connection of the, the, the Jewish caricature of this rich, rich Capitalist. banker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which of course is extremely dangerous because on one hand, they are... Cr Even Marx says, you know, they have really contributed towards helping capitalism build, but whenever capitalism starts collapsing, they're the first scapegoats. Yes. Before we have to speak a bit about uh, Bernard Mandeville and we Adam are Smith, the first um, but one one more thing about Christianity, uh, we all, we already covered the gift and and the forgiveness, and but also in Christianity, there's the tradition, there's the big big tradition that 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 money and and even uh, trade is 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 that's a direct quotation you quote from the Bible, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I think this this uh, tradition is still very much alive, isn't it? Yeah, uh, St. Augustine has an interesting comment. He says, yeah, okay, but it's still love. <laughs> which I thought, which I thought was, was, was funny. So love so is the problem. You know? And of course, we live in the time and age when love is a solution for everything. All you need is love and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So it's better to love money than to love not at all. Another girl? Than to love nothing. Oh, of course, it's better to love money than to love another girl. I mean. Than to love nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Um, no, but that's, love that's is, the love point is, of St. Augustine. The, love is the problem. You know, love Why? Is, uh, I think that money is the problem. Uh, no, Here. love for money is the problem, not money itself. So that, the two by the way, this together. is the most, this is the, officially, this is the most misquoted passage uh, that money is the root of all problem. The original says the love of money, of money is, 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 is the root of the problem. So you can have money, but you should not love it. Yeah. Yeah, money no. is no problem as no. long as you have as you a don't. healthy relationship. Healthy relationship, relationship with yeah. money, yeah. yeah. Every wife will tell you, you can have a healthy relationship with whoever, but you mustn't love her. Love is very jealous. Love is actually a very str I mean, between friends, I don't care if you have another friend except for me. I really would be quite happy to meet him or her. Okay. But when you come That's to an erotic relationship, relationship there, it's very monopolistic. You know. Yeah. In yeah. fact, marriage is... <laughs> It's a monopoly. As in a couple, you, you, come, you go from perfect competition to, to monopoly. <laughs> and monopsony. You, know, you have only one supplier. But that's one, so interesting. Uh, now, this, this is like a sidestep. But, but in, in like, all governments are working against, to, again, are, are, are conscious about the threat of, of certain, certain, uh, certain firms having a monopoly. Yeah. And with, in our personal, in our love relationships, the monopoly works? I don't know. I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, well, it's productive in it's terms productive. of children. Okay. You know. I know enough. Yeah. 
No, of course, of course. I mean, yeah. I don't want to be cynical here. All I'm saying is that, you know, you can fall in love if you're falling in love at the right time with the right person in... It has, it's actually very... It's not as free as it looks like. Try being married and falling in love after you're married. I mean, that's the with beginning. With the same of, woman or with another woman? Well, with another woman. I see. Yeah. Yes. Or a man or whatever. You yeah. know, we live in a liberal time. But Absolutely. Then that love becomes a tremendous problem. It's not that, you know, love whatever you can. You have to be very particular and very articulate with, with your loving because you even have to run some sort of economy of love because if you miss love, if you love something that is not appropriate to love another woman or money or something else, then that becomes the stumbling block. And if you're not, if you're able to dislove, disattach, then that, then you're fine. But the problem is that you're not very often. You're not able to do that. You're not able to disattach. No. It becomes a dictum. It becomes, again, we, I think with love, the same thing like with the economy or like with ethics. The Pharisees fetishized ethics. That's why Jesus criticized them, creating it a dead sort of dead body without okay. any spirit in it. This also, I think, in a way, in our time and age, happened with freedom and with love. We over-fetishized it, and we now are in control. You know, you fall in love, oh. and you can't control yourself. It's like a, you know, so something else is in control. So it's over-fetishized economy, love, and freedom. And freedom. Okay. We even have wars called freedom. You know, I know. Enduring freedom. Operation freedom. Yeah, operation. Yeah. Enduring freedom. And enduring, I really think exactly, enduring. That's yeah. a, this is a good name because I think the proper way how to read the name of this war is can we endure our freedom? We can do whatever, or Americans can do whatever. Can you endure it? Can you endure not doing all that you can do? And I think here we Europeans, we have to be fair because we European intellectuals, we have a tendency to, to look on our American friends and say, you, you are an aggressive superpower, you are here, you know, you are exporting your capitalism, you are exploiting the world, etc., etc. I think that's a very unfair comparison because you're not comparing like to like. If you want to compare America with Europe, then you should compare America as a superpower now with Europe as a superpower mm -hmm. 100 years ago. And we were not all loving as, as a superpower. In fact, compared to what America is doing today, we were the bastards in, 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 well, when we were a superpower yeah. because we literally, literally enslaved the world. We literally, literally colonized the world and imperially tried to impose our culture and Another standard people. of living. Let's go to Mandeville. Bernard Mandeville, a yeah. doctor, yes. half Dutch, I believe. Yes, um, half Dutch, half French. Half French, and he lived in London, no? Yeah. And you call him, and you're not only one of the first modern economists, and he, his theory, basically, he's, he's saying that greed is good. Uh, one of the quotations, you, you, that, 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 that a private sin can be public good, can be, a public, can be good for the public. And, and one of the quotes, one of the famous quotes, also in your book, by Mandeville, is pride and vanity have built more hospitals than all virtues together. That's a very disturbing uh, author, and he... Beautiful. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, because most of his contemporaries, Adam Smith of all... Hated him. Hated him. And it's sort of an irony of history that Adam Smith is now credited with the invention of the invisible hand of the market. Whereas it's Mandeville who... Whereas it was really Mandeville But he didn't coin these words, so... He didn't coin... The, it's always... In, you know, PR is very important. Uh, Adam Smith came up with a beautiful word, invisible hand of the market. Uh, I'm not a literature person, but I try to be sensitive. And you when are. I don't know how to finish an argument, I put some gobbledygook in it. You know, uh, this guy, uh, Keynes, does the same thing. He, from a literary deconstruction, he runs into an argument, he doesn't know what to make of it. And then so the, the animal spirits. The animal spirits. It's beautiful. Also. Anybody could yeah. put in whatever he or she thinks wants, about it. thinks about it, and you're fine. The same thing happened with, 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 Adam, with Adam Smith, with the notion of... He mentions this really only once in all his writing, in this context. Yes. Otherwise, he uses the invisible hand of Jupiter on other occasion, and then the invisible hand of Providence in the third occasion, which looks like government redistribution. And uh, this really has become the crucial point that we remember him today, mm -hmm. although he only meant used it by passing. Same thing happens to Keynes. Animal spirits is the light motif. He also only devotes one chapter to it. 
really just inventing a very nice sounding words that's a cover up for everything. But how important is Mandeville for today's economists? Well, Mandeville, how, Mandeville should, should we take him seriously? Mandeville has to be taken seriously, although I think he, he, he did make uh, logical argumentation in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in his book, into which I don't want to go. But uh, the interesting thing here is uh, egoism is not self-sufficient, even in the writings of Bernard Mandeville, even in the writings of Smith, even in the argumentation of the most extreme right. Uh, egoism is always good for the society. I'm, I'm saying, you know, if you, if you were proper egoists, you don't need to argue about the well-being of the society because you shouldn't care about it. You are egoist. You only care about yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't need the second part of the sentence. Egoism is good for me, period. But this is not the argument they use. They use actually a very altruistic argument. They're saying egoism is good for me, but it's also good for the society. That's what Mandeville is saying. That's what Mandeville is saying. So, But he has a point. I mean, again, I, he, I quote you about Mandeville. If we were allowed the existence of an honest society, we would have to say farewell to economic prosperity and give up an important position in history. So there is, and there's the, the, the point you make a few times in your book, that there is goodness to be found in evil. Yeah, uh, this is the, the more complicated part that there is really no, no clear difference and it's an intertwined thing like I just tried to show between altru uh, egoism and altruism. Mm -hmm. We are mixing it quite, quite, quite freely here in, 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 uh, in argumentation. Uh, more hospitals were built by greed than by, I'm not sure. Uh, Vanity. He used the word vanity. Yeah, but in today's society, it's the government that builds hospitals. A government forces its subjects, us, to pay taxes. Uh, if greed was sufficient to build enough hospitals and vanity, we wouldn't need government build hospitals. But so, like, let, let's say Bill Gates, he's fighting malaria in, in Africa. Yeah. It's not the government that's fighting. Yes. It's Bill Gates. Right. And maybe that's but would you call that egoism or altruism? I'm asking you, I'm not sure. See, it's, it's very difficult to say. But I think vanity plays a role. It's not unimportant. Okay, you can say vanity. You could say, on the contrary, this is the purpose of my life. This is why I was making all this money to be able to, I don't know, but he could make the argument, to be able to help fight malaria. This is not vanity. This is the, the only thing. Microsoft is vanity. This is real. This is the Would real you believe thing. that? I don't know. Why not? Uh, as likely as you could believe the exact opposite. So what I'm saying is this debate of a clear-cut difference between good and evil ever since the Garden of Eden is something that's malicious. There is a whole irony, in fact, to be quite frank. Religious schools try to, try to outtake each other in knowing the difference between good and evil. This is the point of many religions. We can give you the formula. This is good and this is evil. Do not do, do. What would Jesus do? All these you know, very primitive rules that are in fact a continuation of trying to have the knowledge of good and evil. But uh, it, it's not really getting us anywhere. But still you're saying, and, not, and of course you also make the point that you say that, that, that Mandeville is, is relies on uh, Aquinas. He was before Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas, Bef yeah. Aquinas before, who before him uh, also made that point. But we need egoism. We, we need a certain kind of evil we cannot do without. Yeah, this and is, that's, this that's, is, that's an important contribution of Mandeville, as far as, I, as far as I understand you, to the economic thought, to, the, to, the, to yeah. our... This is what Thomas Aquinas says, evil is part of goodness, it is subset of goodness. Even Jesus uses this parable about the weeds in, the. In, in the field, do not take the evil away, wait till the end, because evil has some role to play. First of all, you can distinguish what's good and what's evil, and secondly, it has some role to play which is beyond, which is beyond our grasp. But it's all embedded in good, and that's why I believe human beings are, at the end of the day, good. You don't do evil acts just for, the f for evil itself. Good by nature. By nature. By you nature. actually, by nature, even the way we, we greet each other, how many times do you greet a person and say, I wish you a bad day? You know. 
If it were up to us, I would wish a good day for everybody. It doesn't cost me anything, so I can have these wishes. But even if it cost me a little bit, I would still rather wish you a good well, day than a bad day. Maybe you have one, two people in your life that you wish a bad day to, but, but, but the not majority, many. No. but not too many. So I really think that we're not a bad meaning folk. We can be misinformed, we can be misguided by, by, by religious, scientific, atheistic, whatever, systems of belief, but we're not bad people. No. We, that's why salvation makes sense. If we were rotten to the core, there would be no point of self saving us from the Christian perspective. This is a good point to go to Adam Smith and the Adam Smith problem, because uh, Adam Smith is, is mainly known uh, for his book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, but he's also the author of the uh, theory of moral sentiments. Yeah. And uh, the first sentence of that, uh, that book is how selfish soever men may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and to render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Yeah. That's what you are saying. Exactly. So the, and that's this an important point. So you, 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 you are saying that you're writing that, that Adam Smith is misunderstood. He is not the, the hard economist uh, we take him for nowadays. He's also like an, a philosopher mainly and an ethicist. Well, he was a moral philosopher uh, yeah. all his life. We made him economist uh, later on from the... From, from the, from the from the benefit of the hindsight, but he really, uh, he's far away from saying that egoism is enough. He said it's an important force, we should adjust it in a way that it works, that it's not in a conflict, but it's not the only force that exists. And this is the, this is the thing in economics. I think economics works fine in the middle ground. When it comes to nano-economics, human relationships, economy crumbles. You don't want your family and your friendship to work according to economic rules. So, I mean, maybe it's possible, but we don't want it that way. This is called microeconomics, I mean, behavioral economics. We have a lot of studies showing that people do not behave rationally and egoistically when it comes to personal relationships. And then, and this is my contribution, and this is something that we're learning recently, economy doesn't work on a mega level either. When it comes to a collapse of a country, such as Greece, all economic rules go aside. Wow. When it comes to war, all economic uh, arguments go aside. When it comes to life insurance, we are communists. I mean, communitarian, maybe, to avoid a nasty word. Mm -hmm. Well, Because life insurance, everybody contributes pretty much the same, and uh, you don't have to, even car insurance, Everybody contributes a certain percentage, and if I run into a Jaguar, which would cost me two million, or I don't know how many, you know, euros, I don't have to pay. The, the, the community pays. So in important things, economy does not work very well. So economy works when it comes to tea, water, if it's abundant, books, things that you really can live without. Their economy works reasonably well. But if you actually have a collapse of a big bank, collapse of a big country, there the rules go, uh, go aside and the economy. So those are, in a way, singularities of economics, the, the meta level and the nano level. And I think this is important even in the Greek debate. Uh, you know, the Greek uh, situation is much more similar to a family situation. And that's the problem with Europe. We don't know whether we should approach the Greeks as a market or as a family. We Not don't many know this. people know. Well, but as but a, a claim to know. Yeah, but as, uh, there is no agreement on this. No. We, uh, this European identity is, is a new thing to us. I mean, if my baker breaks his or her leg, I go to another one. It's absolutely fine. I don't love the baker for him. I love him for the bakeries. If my friend or my girlfriend or my wife breaks a leg, I don't go to another one. You know, when your friend is in Some trouble... Some people do. Well, when your friend is in trouble, you go and help him. But if you're supplier is in trouble, you go to, to another one, and that's perfectly fine. And this is what we don't know. Is Greece a family, a European family? Should we help it? Or is Greece just a market that we should actually treat? But if I listen to you, you are saying Greece is a, is a family member. It's a nephew. I think, yes. Niece. And we will be better off if we treat each other like, like that, that, like a family. Yeah. Because if you cut the nation that's in trouble currently, okay, now we cut off Greece 20 years ago, we cut off Finland two generations ago, we cut off Ireland, um, Britain. You know, you end up with a, with a zero, zero set if, 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 you, if, if, if you treat the losers uh, in, in, in legalistic way. A small side remark before, I have two more questions about Adam Smith and then we 
we'll open the discussion to the public. You mentioned life insurances. In, in the US, like, uh, companies can buy life insurances on behalf of their workers and they collect the money, like Walmart sometimes does and the other big companies, I think, they still do this. Do you think this is fair? Do you think this is good practice? What, what do you mean? Like, Walmart sometimes buy, in, buy life insurances for their workers, right. but the worker doesn't collect the money, only maybe 10% of it, Walmart collects it. Oh, and Walmart, and the argument of Walmart is that, well, we invested in this worker, now he is not alive anymore. We should see a bit money back. We yeah, of course, that's um, perverse. That's perverse. That's, you know, human beings not just becoming human resources. You know, nature has become a natural resource. We go there to be sourced. It, it is here offered as, you know, source me. Okay. Human beings have become human resources. Sure that's how the department's called. Yeah, we got yeah. HR departments. Yeah. And now they've even become, you know, sort of uh, betting horses. Yeah. That's perverse. Yeah. I'd like, there was also, this is a bit of a side remark, but I was intrigued by it. It's about the psychology of Adam Smith, the, uh, the psychology of him. You quote Schumpeter, another great economist, and according to you, and I think you're right, but whatever I whatsoever my opinion counts. He's one of the greatest authorities in the field of the history of economic thinking. And Schumpeter, 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 yeah. Schumpeter. And he wrote about Adam Smith, no woman except for his mother ever played a role in his existence. In this and in other respects, the glamours and passions in life were just literature to him. So this is the, the godfather of, of, he's the godfather of modern economy, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. He, he had just, I, I think he also, David Hume was a friend of him. Of his. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. played cards when Adam yeah. Smith was But besides dying, David Hume, there was David just Hume. his mother. What, what, how, how do you psychologize this, this Adam Smith? Uh, I After don't know, you know. You quoted Schumpeter. One way him. reading is that he was a lucky man, you know. That's one way how to read it. Why? Uh, you know, you live life uh, exempt from emotions. Uh, for, for many people, this is a happy choice. Um, you know, we believe that we should be rational beings and then emotions distract us. So a lot of people choose, uh, you know, um, a rational, non-emotional way of living. This obviously was the case of... But so interesting, Adam it was Smith. one of his... Mon it's, it's, it's even bigger than, than, the, than the wealth of nations, the, 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 the theory of moral sentiments. It's all about the happiness of other people and how we are perceived by other people and how we care or should care about other people's happiness or luck. So isn't there a bit of irony? Yeah, or well, uh, this you often find in, in, in theoreticians that they have some sort of a perfect theory, but in, in, their, in their private life it, it's, it's different. But, but, you know, Adam Smith may have been a weird figure, uh, but, you know, Immanuel Kant was also a, a very weird, weird, weird figure. Uh, Wittgenstein was a, a very, very weird figure, and uh, <laughs> Nietzsche was also a, a very weird, weird figure, so uh, perhaps it's the uh, destiny uh, of... Are you weird enough? Of great, I'm, not, I'm not there yet, I'm only I'm not, 35, working, I'm still working normal. Okay. I'd like to end this, this part of the, of the, of the evening um, with a quote that I, I've, I think it's twice in your book, it's by George Stiegler, an economist, a student of uh, Adam Knight. And Frank Knight. Uh, Frank Knight, okay. And uh, Stiegler said, the chief thing which, which the common sense individual wants is not satisfactions for the ones he had, but more and better ones. Yeah. And this is almost Lacanian. I mean, this is like, yeah. we, we spoke also about Zizek before. Yeah. Yeah. This is, we are, we are, this is where, where does uh, Lac Lacan ends and uh, the economy begins? Or exactly. how much Lacan is there to be found in, in the economy? In, yeah, I think this is, a very, this is a very precious contribution that you know, Zizek makes, and I'm also quoting him uh, in the book. It's not the satisfaction of our desires that the desires want, but it's a replication of a, of a, of a new desire. And my contribution is that I'm trying to read this into the original sin. Uh, perhaps this is a nice way to, stop, to, to end the debate. You know, the original sin in the, uh, in, in the book of Genesis is... or has been in the medieval times very often interpreted that the original sin was of sexual nature. Two young, healthy, naked people in the garden, okay, you don't need too much fantasy. But why do we interpret it as a problem? That's, that's a different chapter. But it, you know, the, the book of Genesis doesn't really mention sex at all. What it does mention 14 times is the word consume. 
do not consume the fruit of this tree, da 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 da, uh, Eve consumed and Adam consumed. So, you know, as an economist, I take the liberty to offer a new interpretation of the original sin, that it was a sin of consumption, of overconsumption, of consuming something that you didn't need because there was lots of other fruits. They didn't eat the fruit out of hunger, but out of some sort of lust. weird lust that the snake sort of Implemented created. in them. Yeah. And the curse could also be read in an economic, uh, economic um, interpretation. Because everything that I gave you wasn't enough, nothing will ever be enough. And if she gets the curse of dem you know, demand and supply, with this is the fundamental yeah. pillar of economics, Eve gets the curse of supply, uh, curse of demand, you will desire, but your desires will not be yours. They will be disjointed. They will be somewhere else. And they will rule you. And Adam, poor guy, gets the curse of supply. You will work your ass off in the sweat of your brow. And it will never be enough, enough. with all the technology that you have around you to satisfy all these demands. So this is not, we didn't need capitalism for this inability to satisfy our wants. No. That was before, that's also what you say, I think you quote, quote Wolf, he's also, I didn't know him, an yeah. economist. Wolf is a yeah. theologian. Yes, okay, that, that, that the virus was there all along and it was just waiting for a friendly environment to come alive. The, to the problem when your wishes are unleashed, this is also a big topic of, you know, the, 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 for, the story about the 13th chamber, yeah? This is always out of abundance. This girl who is in this big castle and you know, the master says, do not open the 13th chamber. She never does it because she, needs to, she doesn't have anywhere to put the vacuum clean, cleaner. She does it out of some weird curiosity. I mean, there's, in, there's 12 chambers, which is a lot, even by today's standards. 12 chambers is a, lot. Is, is a lot. Why do you open the 13th one? Because, well, it's, because not it's not allowed. Because it's not allowed. Exactly. Yeah. But then, also, in, uh, take the golden, wish, uh, the cold, golden fish fairy tale. You know, all these fairy tales, when your id machine is unleashed, all your desires are materialized, you end up worse than when you started. All these stories are actually, well, the first way how to read fairy tales, of course, is you have to re remember who's reading the fairy tales to who. Usually the fairy tales have, have, has a morale, feed old people. That's sort of what all fairy tales are telling you. And of course, there must have been some sort of agenda with you know, grandmothers telling these fairy tales, tales to you know, young feed me, kids, yes, you know, yes, feed me at the end of the day. Speaking of because, egoistics. Because, yeah. So there was economics even, even in that. But, but there is this sort of, uh, this is how Zizek reads uh, Stalker, the, the movie. Uh, there is a zone that fulfills all your wishes, but it doesn't fulfill what you want to want. I mean, sorry, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't fulfill what you want to want, but what you really want. So this guy goes into the zone, he pays a lot of money, and he wants to want his brother, who is sick, to get healthy. He gets in, next day his brother dies, but he wins million rubles in, in a lottery. What happened? Well, the zone was faithful. It, mater it fulfilled his desires. But the problem is he filled his real desires, not the desires that he desired to desire. So he desired to desire the health of his brother, but he really desired to win in a lottery. So the problem is we don't know our desires, and this is the Lacanian uh, Thing. twist to it. Yeah. We don't know what we want, but we won't stop before we get there. Because our the, 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 the center of our desires might be something very destructive. This is the distractive. This is why we feel injustice in the society, because we have an idea of just society. And that's what really is the spectral ghost that scares you. Not the injustice itself, but the idea of yeah. justice. But you're not a stoic, aren't you? you? You don't believe that we should give up our desires, so that we should learn how to not desire anymore. I think I'm something between a stoic and hedonist. Uh, I think we should try to make, I mean, I think the motto here is try to make everybody happy, including yourself. I mean, I think that's a nice compromise between stoicism and, and hedonism. And tonight you're more on the hedonistic side? On the well, it's Friday, we'll see. <laughs> I think I open the discussion to the public. Uh, please ask questions, no monologues, and um, you can start now. And somebody will walk around with the mic, so we can all hear you. I guess there's the mic. 
I think there's a question. Whoops. Oh. Hedonist. Hedonist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, just to bring the question back a little bit to economics, um, I love the metaphysical uh, stuff of the discussion. Uh, last week in the Netherlands, uh, new plans represented what the economy will look like, and that kind of will dictate what our policymakers will actually be doing for the next year or so, and probably for a lot more years than that. But if I hear what you're saying correctly, um, there's a lot more going on than just the metrics. So as an economist, what would your suggestion be, for kind of, how do we actually get the values back in that are not 42? Yeah, okay, that's, that, that's, that's, that's a very good question. I think one of the fundamental problems of economics is that we have many values in our lives. Some of them have a number, water, book, sniffing tobacco, this chair. That's a value that we value a lot, and we can buy it, it has a number, it has a proxy. There are other values in our lives that we value very much. They're not necessarily better, but they don't have a number. Clean air, love, friendship, ethics, art, beauty, and faith, peace, these sort of things that you can never put a proper number upon. So no matter what the quality of the matrix is, no matter how high sophisticated mathematics you're running, you always end up with a result that is leaping on one leg because, because here you're running an equation, half of which, or we don't even know what percentage is what, can never be calculated with. And there is one movement in economics trying to put numbers to things that naturally do not have a number, which is, for example, clean air. So we're trying to proxy clean air by carbon emissions, for example. And, or we're trying to, instead of GDP, which is a stupid statistic, we're trying to put uh, the happiness index. That's one way how to solve the problem. Uh, my suggestion is, well, I don't think this is going to work because you will never be able to put an, uh, even if we don't want to put a number on every value. That would be, in a way, a little bit perverse. You would have to put the value on love and you don't really want to do that. Probably you could, but my suggestion is, well, maybe we should take the numbers less seriously. That every number is not a full ontological uh, value thing. One way how to look at it is that the markets really don't licitate value, but they dictate value. How do you know that water is cheaper than milk? Well, market tells you this. If we two, let's imagine you live here and I live in Prague. You want to live in Prague, I want to live here. Let's swap houses. So we could just say, okay, let's do it one for one and let's just do the swap. Until some of us would say, well, wait a minute, let's, my, let's test the value of the house vis-a-vis -vis the market. In other words, let's give up our internal assessment of the value, one to one, and let's ask the market for the real objective value. And there we find out that your house is twice as expensive as mine, and if we want to do the swap, I have to pay you the difference. What's happening here is that you are giving up, in fact, your own values, which at the end of the day, and we're coming back to Lacan, we don't know how to assess. Is your house more expensive or more valuable than mine? There is really, it's very difficult to, to put that. So we go to the market and we subject our exchange to the dictate of the price that somehow. Uh, so what you do is you give up the subjective uh, assessment of value and you take upon the objective dictate or the value as agreed by the society. So if you want to know the value of your house, you have to go to the market. You don't know the value of the house, you need to, as if you're selling it, what would be, what would be uh, the demand. So, so, so that's methodologically answering, answering that. The second part of answering your question is what shall we do in the future? Well, our politicians have to do what the markets want. In fact, now I think our public policy is dictated by what the debt wants. In other words, <coughs> uh, in the past, we've been taking on debts. Why? Because we wanted to increase the degrees of freedom. 
we could do a little more, buy a little more highways, buy a little more schools, consume a little bit more, big thanks to debt. We've overused this capacity, and we, again, the subject-object reversal, debt was supposed to serve us, now we are serving it. We've lost degrees of freedom, and the maneuver space of politicians is, in a way, to a large degree, dictated by the markets. This was the plea that Sarkozy had, and even Clinton mentions this. You know what? I can't do my policies. I have to actually do what the markets tell me. So if a rating agency says, dear Sarkozy, if you increase or decrease the taxes, depending on what we feel, we as a rating agency will downgrade you. If we downgrade you, France goes bankrupt. So the degrees of freedom that you have are, are nil. Sarkozy was quite right there, but it was politics that maneuvered themselves into this situation of being cornered by what the debt wants. So again, the game that we've been playing has a life of its own, and now we need to follow what the debt wants from us. Or more precisely, what the speakers or the press officers of debt the rating agencies want. You need to consult it with them. Another question? W w wait for the mic, please, then you can ask the question. Come on. Yes, uh, with regard to debt, um, there's been a discussion about debt redemption for the third world countries for, for I think, 40 years or so. Um, what if we would decide politically as um, uh, well, de democratic citizens to not pay our debts, to counsel them out because you know on one side you have investors and on the other side you have these debtors and basically it's all the people. Um, how do you look at, up to, the, to that possibility? Of cancelling? Cancelling debt. Just our not own paying. debts. Our own debts. Well because the problem with that is that you know your investors would be very disappointed. But that's us. And that's you. So if you said, okay, um, uh, your government does not need to pay debts, you have eff effectively lost your savings in your bank, which happens sometimes in history, but it's very uncomfortable. But you, you made a plea for the 49th year, the Jubilee year, the f so cancelling out all well, debts. Well, but this must be an agreement ahead of time. You must okay. know that must the debt is not a proper debt, it's, it, it's a lease of a okay. debt. And you know this ahead of time. What's happening now, in a way, is happening spontaneously. Please. Without, It's not systemic. People don't know that they're losing money. No, <laughs> the, 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 the solution to the crisis is unsystemic. Everybody knows what we're doing is an unsystematic solution. What we're trying to do with saving Greece and saving Ireland is we're trying to buy time, not for Greece, but for ourselves, to come up with a more systematic arrangement. This was a systematic arrangement. I'm not saying we should do it, but it had logic in, in those days, and maybe we could research this area, and maybe it would make more sense to have um, this collapse in a way planned, and, and, uh, and what you're suggesting would work if it be known. Yes, but in 49 years, debts will be cancelled. In 49 years, debt slaves will be released and um, the property will be returned to their original owners. Could be done if it be agreed. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, extremely non-systematic. Yeah. And it could result in, in, in a fatal collapse. And the problem is, if you do this, if you actually default on your debt, nobody will lend you any more money because that's not a loan, that's effectively a gift. So that's the problem with, with gift forgiveness. Uh, of course, it does happen. It's an unsystematic solution. Uh, but until we find a better system, we somehow need to cater to it. My point is the system is not very clever. The system does not stand for very long. The system crumbles under its own weight from time to time. Every 49 years. No, well, not maybe, but, but it, yeah. once in a while. Another question? Yes. It's maybe a little bit more personal for you, but I was more watching this as a one-man show and I couldn't really grasp what your aim was. But what I noticed was when you were talking about the missionary schools that you kind of get angry. So you know, like a teaching what's good and what's wrong and what's evil. So what's your, what's your 
psychological background with the, with the schools, you know? I'm fascinated by that because suddenly... What do you mean? I, I ever talked about missionary schools? Well, the schools that were, how you say that, they were competing in co explaining what was good and evil and that they knew the best, the religious schools. Well, you, you, I think that's, you, you said something that was a side remark about all religions. Schools. Yes. The, with what? With oh, all, sorry. It was a side I, remark about all religions claiming to know and claiming to... Oh, yeah, 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 no, no, but this has nothing to do with missionary school. This is true for every, every, ethic, every ethical school is trying to know the difference be, yeah, yeah, between yeah. good and evil and institutionalize it and sort of find this is the formula, this is good and this is evil. I'm saying there was a certain irony because the whole moral downfall was the knowledge of good and evil. But I never attended a missionary school. Oh, oh no, 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 I, I misunderstood. <laughs> Except for economics. Right. You know. <coughs> I think your answer has been, your question has been answered, and let's move on to another question. Because what angers me is the irony of it. Uh, my point is, my point is that there is very little distance between religion and economics, between psychology and economics, between myths of old and myths of current. That's my point. But that doesn't make you angry, necessarily. Well, some of them are very stupid. Would also make me angry. I was very angry when I was talking about us making our assumptions into beliefs. I was very angry during that because it's stupid. Okay, uh, maybe a last question, the gentleman over here. Um, what do you see as the most important uh, development, developments in present time uh, within our society? Um, that makes us move to a more sustainable society? I, I think the crises, in a way, because uh, our behavior as European in this crisis has been actually quite healthy. First of all, the dream of all sort of Europhils, of which I am one, that people will talk about European issues in pubs has materialized. This never happened in the last 50 years of European integration. When I had a seminar on European affairs seven years ago, nobody would come for a very good reason. It was a non-issue, non-topic. Today I can go to the least village in the Czech Republic or anywhere, and, and it's usually packed, and it, the topic can be European Union, and, and people are actually interested. And, you know, of course, it didn't happen the way we wanted to, but still the goal was fulfilled. People are interested in Euro, people talk about European Union, and it's a very big controversy, and it's a healthy thing that we go through the debate. Secondly, we are running to each other's help. For the first time, I think, in the history of Europe, when a nation is on its knees, economically bankrupt, we don't attack it militarily. We actually go and help it. <laughs> You know, if Greece happened 70 years ago, the only thing we would be debating here is, should we first send the artillery, or should we first fly Air over Force, and do yeah. like and some little bit of bombing, yeah. and then perhaps we could take whatever. This is a laughing matter, and thank God it's a joke. But it wasn't a joke 70 years ago. I mean, Hungary is on its knees. 70 years ago, Slovaks would be, yes, you know, or Czechs, I mean, of course, we are, we, have been like that in the history. Uh, that's a second good development that I'm actually very proud. We are trying to help the Irish, we are trying to help the Hungarians, we're trying to help the Icelanders, we're trying to help the Greeks. Of course, you will say, we're trying to help in order to help ourselves. Fair enough, but seven years ago, we tried to destroy them so that we can help ourselves. In this, the European mentality has really changed. Why have we become more uh, loving? Yes, I would argue that. In a way, we have actually have become more loving. It has become a family. They're not enemies anymore. Uh, but also, I think Could they become enemies again? Huh? Like, could they become enemies again? Like what we saw in the 90s in, in former Yugoslavia? I, I think it could, but you would have to put a lot of effort into it. It's not a natural thing. You know. um, and the third thing is actually part of the thank you should even go to European structures. Why? Well, you know, let's imagine the crisis came and we didn't have Euro and we didn't even have the European Union. What would happen? Impossible to know, but judging from history, probably what always happens, 
when a country is in uh, in uh, crisis, in a depression, what it did, it you increase your tariffs, a word that we don't no longer use, by the way. You imp you block imports and you subsidize your exports. You devaluate your currency. Devaluating your currency is not a solution. It never was a solution. It devaluated currency does not really increase your competitiveness. It is more appropriate to say that it decreases the competitiveness of your business partners. And, we've, and, you, and you artificially block well imports and you, and you basically do beggar your neighbor policy. Trade wars often end up in real wars. The fact that European institutions forbid the temptation of trade wars is also something that we should say, you know, that is something we've moved. We, 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 and talking about this devaluation, this seems to be many Eurosceptics or many economists that advocate that Greece should be exempt from, from Euro. The, the key argument there is so that Greece can devaluate yeah. and perhaps adopt the new, new drachma. Devaluation it's not a magical solution to, to every problem. First of all, we've already have it. We've been there. We have the T-shirt. And devaluation works maybe if one country is in a depression and the others are not. The others are growing very well, and they can tolerate um, decrease in their competitiveness. So for example, my country, Czech Republic, 20 years ago, we devaluated our currency, and the rest of Europe didn't mind because you guys were growing, and we could have sort of thrown the anchors, and you pulled us out of the pit by your growth. If the whole country, or if the whole continent is flat, devaluation will not be tolerated by others. You will have the spiral of, of devaluation. And secondly, it will uh, not really help because uh, these countries are not growing as, as, as we have it. So uh, these developments, I would say, we don't have negative leaders in Europe. I mean, we have the, the leaders that stand up are really... Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But it's already been since 2007, almost seven years, six years, still no negative leaders compared to the last crises, 20s and 30s, <clears throat> that really resulted in the catering of hatred. You don't see that. Uh, so from a, if you were asking from a European point of view, this is what I'm really proud as a European. I think on this note, we should end the evening. Okay. Uh, as I think you're also developing a cult, so maybe it's time for beer. Okay. It's Friday evening, as you said before, so it's time to be a bit hedonistic. Okay. You agree with me? Uh, for a couple of hours, yes. For a couple of hours. <laughs> so uh, Thomas will be available at the bar, and uh, you might or might not uh, have another one-man show, as the woman said, but also you, all of you can have your own one-man show at the bar. So thank you, Thomas, for being here tonight. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for you. having me. And um, I wish you all good night and see you another time. Thank you. Vanavond in de Bali. Mijn naam is Juri Albrecht. Ik ben de inhoudelijk directeur van de Bali. En um, I'm going to continue in English because this evening is going to be in English. It's the first evening in this series which is going to be in English. Um, because before this we had Arnon Grunberg talking to Job Cohen, to Micha Wertheim, um, to other people. Um, we staged this, this series. Because we think it's very important that we have a place in Amsterdam where art meets politics or science. And that we have a long time to speak to each other. Because if you listen to the radio, if you watch TV, it's hardly possible to really see a dialogue um, 
on some sort of a level. So we're very happy that Arnon Grunberg invited Thomas Sattlisek. We're very, very happy to have you both here. Um, I'm not going to introduce you. That's Arnon Grunberg going to do. Um, this is uh, the first series of this year. We're going to do several others this year. And I'm, um, I'm very happy that you're both here. Enjoy your evening. Good evening, Thomas. Um, Thomas and I just had dinner, and over dinner, Thomas said, the question doesn't matter. And my aim tonight is to ask at least one question that matters. And can I pick it? Uh, you can pick okay. it. Let me know afterwards with the Which question. One yes, exactly. Maybe you will not even recognize it. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, okay. yeah, maybe not. Um, Thomas and I met a few months ago in March, I believe, at the Prague Writers' Festival. Then I thought that you were a novelist. Soon I discovered that you were an economist. Yes. For a while, I thought yes, you had also written a novel, but tonight you told me that that's not true, that's false. I don't remember writing one. You don't, but you, yeah, you, I have to check my CV. Yeah, maybe, maybe unconsciously you wrote one, but you maybe. told me that, that you would like to write a novel. Yes. And one of the If I already wrote it, then I'm not going to, to do, do the so same mistake again. So you check if you wrote it, and maybe, okay, that's, that's a good, that's good. Um, one of the main arguments in, in the book, and the book is the, the, the reason why we are here tonight, uh, your book, Economics of Good and Evil, the quest for economic meaning from Gilgamesh to Wall Street is basically that the eco economists uh, focus too much on numbers and they should turn to philosophy, psychology, literature. So there is a connection between you and a novel already in this book. Uh, to give the people who haven't read this book yet uh, um, an idea of what it's about, I'd like to show a short uh, film that I found on YouTube, of course you know it. It's a film where you um, basically explain the first macroeconomic um, prediction in the world. Okay. You know what will come. Okay, let's, let's see the... One of the claims that I have is that economics has become religion uh, or priests, we do a similar thing, people listen to the question, what shall I do, which was originally placed, uh, asked, people asked Jesus this question, this is what um, we ask economists today. As you know, the government has two tools how to influence the economy. One is called the fiscal policy, and the other one is called monetary policy. And let me tell you, in both of these um, uh, policies, uh, an alternative uh, explanation how, how these developed. Let's start with fiscal policy. Monetary policy, just briefly put, is the monopoly of the government to print money. This is, of course, simplification, but for the purposes of the debate, this will suffice. And fiscal policy is the monopoly of the government to indebt others, as if in your stead. We are now in sort of a, a business cycle, a very, very strange kind of a maybe we're getting from the bottom back again, but it definitely is a business cycle. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what was the very first business cycle and compare it to the current most recent one. Okay, so what is the oldest business cycle in the written history of mankind? <laughs> it is the Pharaoh's dream in Genesis chapter 32 when, when Pharaoh had a dream about seven fat and seven lean cows. This is the very first business cycle that we know of in the history of mankind. I, I, I tried to search deeper. I couldn't find any, anything uh, as close as, as this. So Pharaoh has a dream, seven fat cows, seven lean cows. He doesn't know what to make of it, so he calls Joseph. Joseph is a, is a Hebrew prophet, and he says, well, congrat in today's language, of course. He says, congratulations, Pharaoh. You just had a macroeconomic prediction 14 years uh, ahead of time, so to speak. You will have, and this is the point where I will use the flip chart, You will have seven years and seven bad years, lean years. So here we have grain, or today we would say GDP. So he asks, what can be done? And uh, Joseph says, well, you know, because he was reading your great economist, John Maynard Keynes, so he was educated in Keynesian. He said, well, in the good years, do not eat everything that grows, but save, and he says one-fifth, this is of course 20% of GDP growth, and um, store it as a sort of an energy in your store greenhouses, as if in a battery. And then, of 
course, this is not hard to predict, spend it, invest it uh, during the bad years. So in other words, here he was doing saving. And then this word is investment. This one we know very well. So in other words, you take the energy from the good years. So in other words, you slow down GDP growth, which is a common misunderstanding, the understanding that I think politicians and the general public have, and even many economists about themselves, that the role of the economist is to increase GDP growth. This is nonsense. The role of the economist is to decrease the amplitude of the business cycle. So if we are to increase GDP growth from minus 10 to, say, minus 3, then we must inevitably slow down GDP growth during the bad years. So in other words, in good years do, uh, well, in bad years do expansionary fiscal policy and in good years do contractory fiscal policy. In other words, um, today we would say take in more taxes, this is T, than you give out in expenditures. This sounds very provocative, but the economy behaves often like a bipolar um, patient with a bipolar disorder. It tends to overdo its good uh, uh, years and turn them into ma ma manias. And it also tends to exaggerate its bad moods and turn into depression. Now, those of you who have ever encountered bipolar disorder or manic depressive uh, situation, you know that the first thing to treat if you want to treat a patient in this situation is you treat the manias. Now, let's fast forward some 3,000 years till today. Okay. We also had seven very good years. In fact, if you want to be somewhat ironic, you could even go down and say that th these seven years have been bracketed by two significant events in the history. One was the year 2001, which wasn't just important for the September attacks, but you know that this was the last year when America had surplus budget in, in, in the Clinton administration. This is the year when, when the presidency changed. This is also the year when, um, uh, when Fed started charging extremely aggressively low levels of, of, of interest rate, etc., etc. And uh, the world had a great seven years, not just America, not just Great Britain, but the whole of Europe, and in fact, the whole of our civilization, and even um, the whole world. The whole world grew in average in 5% uh, uh, GDP growth per year, which is which was crazy. This was ended by Lincoln Brothers, 2008, and it was also September. So anyway, my point here is it was seven good years, even in our times, that we actually enjoyed this robust levels of growth. So what have we done? Just to speed up the talk, we've done this. We've done exactly the opposite. We've spent more than we grew. So not only did we eat everything that we could, but this was not only empty, but it was full of IOUs lying all over the floor. Ridding ourselves, of course, of any energy left to save or cushion the bad years. We should have had budget surpluses here, saving energy for, for, for bad years. Instead, we did the exact opposite. Well, anyway, what's my point? My point here is that a story that we tell to seven-year-old children that they can understand, story which is from primitive times of some 3,000 years, story which actually only has very few uncomplicated numbers and no calculations, had in it more wisdom than we have today. We've not been able to persuade our politicians to keep to this basic with them, with hundreds of thousands of very highly educated economists with all sorts of mathematical models and regressions. We've not been able to, we've not, we've been able to actually overlook this sort of basic, uh, basic wisdom that um, we've seen human, mankind uh, adopt during the first recorded business cycle. Thank you for this explanation here. Um, I think you make, we will, one of the chapters in your book is about the Old Testament, and then we will talk a bit more about uh, Moses and, and his uh, predictions. But in, in this short film, you, you make two provocative statements. First of all, you are saying that the economy is a bit like a patient 
with a, uh, with, a, with a disorder, with a bipolar disorder. And the second, also quite provocative statement is that, that not only the politicians, but also the economists should have read the Bible more carefully. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't we do that? Why didn't they do that? Let's start there. Um, uh, you know, it has to do, I think, with the mania, because um, one of the f first descriptions of a patient in the manic stage is that he feels like a demi-god, or maybe a, a, a god proper. We feel that we understand everything, we are spending much more money than we can afford, and it seems like the world is rosy, and better still, a rosy outlook. This is exactly, if you deconstruct the macroeconomic situation and also the predictions, this falls very well in that category. So if you actually took all the literature that we had during these, you know, jolly years, and you gave them to a psychoanalyst, he would say, well, you know, this is, this is, um, this is, this is manic. So the first mistake we did, I think, and we're learning that it was a mistake, is that we thought that we understand what's happening. We thought we have it figured out. Um, we meaning economists, economists, politicians. Economists, especially economists, all politicians, but also the general public. We thought, you know, Alan Greenspan was named, uh, you know, the, the, the one economist who has invented a non-cyclical economy. It was supposed to just go up all the time. Everything's going to be even better and better. Uh, it's actually interesting even to, to take this debate, this is an old video, but uh, the debate today, you know. Um, uh, so the first description of a mania is that you spend much more money than you, you can afford. Secondly, you have this very sanguine, optimistic outlook of the present and the future. And third, very interesting, these people are very efficient, very productive, and very hardworking during their manic stages. They basically don't sleep, they work all the time. They're as efficient and as productive as you could have them. Now, uh, let's take Greece and Ireland and compare them. Let's say, okay, Greece is an economy that is depressed, let's say. Um, of course, if you read between the lines, what you get is if Greeks would work twice as much as they do, they wouldn't have a problem. Let's take the same view, the same grid, and let's have a look on, for example, Ireland. The case there is exactly the opposite. It's a manic situation. So if, if Irish bankers, especially, work half the time they did, they wouldn't have a problem. And uh, you know, the Irish situation is much more fundamentally the root of the problem. The Greek problem isn't really sort of, it's a friendly fire casualty mm -hmm. of war. It's actually intellectually uninteresting. Everybody in this room knows what to do. Wasn't it, it was a Dutch politician, I think, who said some years ago, you know, the problem with politicians is not that we don't know what to do. We know precisely what to do. What we, not, what we don't know is how to get elected after no. doing it, you know. <laughs> and, but with Greece, it's clear. Everybody sort of on a technical level knows what to do. But what should you do with Ireland, the Irish crisis, or the um, American crisis? And this, I think, is the root of the problem, you know. It's not the lack of growth that led us into the crisis, as is commonly, uh, you know, said in the media, but it's actually too much of it. Most economies went bust while actually full throttle uh, growth what was happening. The, alcohol, the um, depression allegory also works very well with alcohol. Uh, it's like if you try to treat an alcoholic by treating his hangovers, or her, of course. We have to speak politically correctly. So uh, if she is a drunkard, uh, you're not really helping her or him uh, much by solving the, the hangover problem. You know, let's imagine that we invent a magic bullet to solving mm -hmm. the hangovers, which everybody would very much like. Will that help the alcoholism? No, it will probably make alcoholism even worse. If you want to treat an alcoholic, you have to treat the excessive usage of alcohol. And even this parallel, I think, even goes further. I don't know how you say that here in, in, in Netherlands, but when we get a little bit too intoxicated, in the morning, yes we say we take uh, by the hair of the dog. What killed you yesterday Today, will help you again. 
Huh? You will, so you drink a little bit of beer or booze? Yeah, whatever yeah, it was, whatever. if you can remember. If you can remember. What, course, whatever yes. it was yeah. Uh, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. That's helpful. And we are seriously applying the same method in our macroeconomic policy. Let me demonstrate three points. First of all, the common sort of consensus among economists is what led us into the crisis was too much consumption on cheap credit. Fine. What's the solution now that we are in the middle of crisis? Even more consumption. The problem is we don't consume enough. We don't, you know, we people we don't should, spend enough. Yeah, they should go no. back into their manias. Second example. Um, what was the problem, especially with Fed? Too cheap money, too low interest rate. What's the solution to the problem? Cheaper money. Exactly. Even more cheaper money. And you can even go with the rating agencies. What was the problem? Too sanguine rating agency giving triple A's with pluses to everybody that they met on the street. What's the solution? Well, even more triple, quadruple A's, if possible. You know how Sarkozy reacted in the frantic fury of, of, of fear when France was, was being downgraded. Right. I mean, everybody you know, saw that they're not as beautiful as they used to be when they were young. But the problem was, you rating agencies are causing the crisis because you are actually admitting the real situation. Right. And we don't have any other cure except for, for you know, um, whatever killed us. And the same thing goes for growth, you know. This is but before we go back to the Bible, to the Old Testament, are you saying that bankers and also politicians shouldn't see economists but should go to psychoanalysts? Or is this what you are suggesting? I mean, well, I'm saying this in jest, but it's a bit more than that. I mean... Yeah, I think there is lots of that. I think there is... I mean, you can hear it. What I really enjoy doing, you take the most serious analysis, I don't know how many economists are here in the room or how many of you read it, but do it once in a while. Take a very serious uh, a banking statement and read it very carefully. Most, uh, most enjoyable is to read something that's like one year old. There you see it very clearly. But the markets are nervous. The markets are, uh, uh, the sentiment of the market is, these are all code words for we don't know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, or the markets are acting in an irrational way, or we have animal spirit at work. Animal spirit you know, sounds very sense. scientific, but uh, all that it says is uh, sometimes human beings behave we don't know. We don't know, but that's animal spirits come from Keynes. That's right. And it's also in your book. That's you, right. Yeah. So, so this is a perfect excuse for everything. You know, we have, I think, this holy triangle in economics. One is called the invisible hand of the market. The other one is called homo economicus. And the third one is called animal spirits. In between this triangle, you can explain anything. And you, of course, do it psychologically. I mean, my son, I have a five-year-old son, so I watch with him, I watch with him these ch children's stories. And he used to like uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay. So if you take the English words and you randomly select words, you are more likely to come up with something more sensible than teenage, mutant, ninja, turtles. I mean, these four words have no meaning whatsoever. Well, maybe there's one other phrase that is a little bit more crazy than teenage, mutant, ninja, turtles, and that is invisible, hand of the market. I mean, that's even, I mean, I can get the teenage mutant fighting t Ninja Turtles, but what exactly do I mean? Um, and this is serious economists who don't believe in mythology, uh, yet we are using this, using this every day. And the question that you always have to say, there is no other way of phrasing it, is do you believe in yes. the invisible hand of the market? And the answer is yes, I do believe, I, or I don't believe. So it is a psychological discipline, of course. Speaking of myth mythology, um, in your book you make the case that, that economists uh, should study the mythology more carefully. And, and in this, this, this video we just saw, uh, you make it quite clear that, that, that I, I ask myself the question, why hasn't come up, why is, are you the first one to come up with this idea about going to the Bible? It, it's so clear. Why, why haven't we studied the Bible before you? Because we think it has nothing to do with each other. It's we think the Bible is not connected to the economy. Yeah, we feel that, it's, that art, Bible, faith, beauty, uh, subjectivity is on the polar opposite to science, hard facts, numbers, laws. Uh, this, I think, is, 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 is what led us also partially into this. Um, I think it's easy to show that the economy would not be able to stand without religious norms. And 
Max Weber and others made this, so I'm not, I will try to make a more difficult case. I even would like to argue that religion does not stand without economics. Take Christianity, for example. What is so special about Christianity compared to other religion? It's this whole idea of redemption. Somebody pays for your sins. And uh, in original Greek, the word sin and debt yeah, are, are, are synonyms. In, in German, it works the same, schuld. It also works in Aramaic. And it also works in Latin. Demini nos, debita nostra. So you have your debit card. Diminish our, our debits. Is, 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 forgive us our debts forgive as we sins. forgive those yeah. who are. This was the prayer of the Wall Street boys. <laughs> forgive us our debts as we don't forgive those who are indebted to us. And in fact, if you really want to stretch it, um, Take, on a Sunday, take Financial Times or whatever you have and substitute the word debt for sin and you really get a gospel. <laughs> so let me translate, okay? The Greeks are falling under the weight of their sins, debts. They can no longer carry their sins. They need a redeemer. Somebody with higher credit. Credit in Latin is belief, faith. To redeem them, to take over their sins and pay for them. So, you know, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, to separate. Only thing you need to know, it's even but credit crunch, if, you know. if we take the New Testament again seriously, we should have forgiven the Greek people. Yeah, and in, we fact, didn't. in fact, the debate, should we forgive Greeks or not, is, I would argue, the Christian 2,000-year-old debate, law versus grace. Should we treat them according to the law? I mean, you guys signed it, it's the law follow the law, or should we be graceful and forgive them? And then, how many times should I forgive? If my brother, you know, <laughs> that's against me, should I forgive him seven times? Or, you know, 77, I'm, of course, the solution isn't there, but it's the same, same debate. Even the word credit crunch, if you translate that into, from Latin into English, it means faith crunch. And this, I think, is the fundamental problem. Our faith has crunched. We, have, we don't know what to believe anymore. This is why I think there's so much hatred going through economists, not that we earn too much money or, or I mean, sports people and artists also, um, some yeah. of them earn your ridiculous amounts of money. The problem is we have, <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is we, ha we, we have been teaching a false belief, which ourselves we didn't actually believe. For example, it's like, don't meddle. You're, sh you're serious? The economists didn't believe what they were teaching? They did believe it, and suddenly the, the first pain came, and they gave up their faith very readily. Oh. Do not meddle, governments, you know, arm's length, okay. please don't meddle. Come Lehman Brothers, please meddle. Please intervene. We are not self, and we can't regulate ourselves. Uh, please redeem us. Take away our sins as we... You know, and that's what the government did. And that's what the government did. So, because you know, instead of God, many sociologists argue that in today's society, you know, government or the society has taken the role of God. And this is sort of, if you substitute these two, that's the role of the creditor of last resort. Last week, European Central Bank became the creditor of, of last resort. So there again, translate that becomes the believer of last resort. In other words, when nobody else believes, you have to believe. And you have to believe ostensibly, much more than everybody else. We will talk later a bit more about the economic teachings of the New and the Old Testament. Let's go to the beginning of your book, in the first chapter, basically in the foreword. Um, you write uh, this sentence. You say, great leaders are foremost creators of stories. Yeah. Um, Explain this a bit. Do you think that everybody who's a storyteller is automatically also a great leader? Or how does this function? Well, let's, let's take an example from, from how, how myths become facts. Okay? Solus, who was a Greek pre-Socratic philosopher, said a wonderful thing. He said, myth is a something that never happened, but it's happening always. Did you ever meet a homo economicus? No. But then again, everybody is one. No matter what you do, you are homo economicus. But more specifically, what we economists do is we assume, and this sounds very scientific, so when I want to do my little nice models, I have to assume that human beings are rational, self-utility-maximizing -utility individuals, to take an easy case. I assume that, and that's okay. 
The problem begins when later on... But why do you, excuse me for interrupting you, you have certain reasons to, for assuming that, no? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easier to calculate. Okay. Otherwise, it's impossible. That's the only yeah. okay. This is the only reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's like with the physics, when you want to calculate the free fall of a subject, you assume a stupid thing that there is no friction of air. Of course there is friction of air, thank God, otherwise we would explode yeah. immediately. But we just, for, we trick, we make a little trick and say, let's assume, of course we know this is stupid, but for a while, let's assume that there is no friction of air, and alas, hallelujah, the calculation is simpler. It's all because of the calculation. Where the mistake and the fun begins is, you close your work and you go into a pub in the evening and you meet a friend and you say, you know what I discovered today? That human beings are rational, optimizing egoists. It's like if this physics guy went into the pub later in the day and said, you know what I discovered? Friction of air doesn't exist. So what there, an assumption, which we know is a technical, stupid assumption, useful but stupid, not real, in the evening actually becomes the truth. Just to demonstrate the point, it's the difference between me saying, let's assume I have 100 million euros, and saying, I have 100 million euros. You immediately feel the difference. One is a myth, a fancy, a fairy tale. Okay. But, and I think this is where we create these myths. This is where we create stories. We actually take our assumptions, and we, create, we make them, we believe in them. So what you're saying is that economists were or are uh, bad psychologists and not so good novelists. Well, they're very that poor philosophers, in a way, because from an assumption that's technical, they are ready to go into a philosophical debate and actually say, yes, there is no friction of air, because we've proved it. it proved it, it all adds up. Of course, this is, I call this MacGyver economy, you know, MacGyver. He invents a magical solution to everything. And of course, when you shoot these movies, you have to shoot it backwards. Accidentally, there is a scotch tape. Accidentally, there is, you know, I don't know what, some uh, sun is shining and you have a magnifying glass, and accidentally there is a black paper. So it all seems very spontaneous and natural. He just looks around and he takes these things. But of course, it's very meticulously made backwards so that it all looks very spontaneous. This is the way we construct our models uh, but as well. why, why is it that you, uh, they, I think you're still an economist, could get away with this for so many years? How come? Well, because I run very quickly. That's... But all, you know, I, I published the book and, 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 and then I, I, I took it into the theatre, so before my critiques had the time to write a proper criticism, I was already for Running? a year okay. hidden in the theatre. Let's theater. not speak about you, but about the others. The others, I don't know. But, but uh, this has been going on in economics f for, for many years, but it was always undercurrent. I mean, even Keynes says you can't use mathematics too much. Even Keynes says we fetishized economics. And this is the problem with, uh, with any fetish. And it doesn't work just with economics, it works with morals as well. The, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees was you fetishized ethics. You can do this with ethics, you can do this even with nation. You fetishize a nation, you end up in a war. This is what we've done in Europe many times. Now we've fetishized economics. There's nothing wrong, I think, with economics per se. The problem is that you, you fetishize it, and then it starts controlling you. You know, Jesus' argument against the Pharisees was in a way similar to what the Occupy movement says uh, against economists. You've created a, a structure, a body that's without a soul. It's dry, it's dead, it doesn't serve us, it goes against us. It became a burden. Ethics was always supposed to be an engine. You do ethical things because you are propelled to do so, not that ethics is something that holds you back and you would very much like to, but you can't because you have some moral... So now the economy has become a burden that's controlling us instead of we controlling the economy. Yes, I would argue. And basically, that's what you over dinner, you, you mentioned, we spoke a bit of Mil Milan Kundera, yeah. and you said that's typically for a Milan Kundera story. Yeah. Somebody creates a story, that, and the, the creator of this story cannot control the story anymore. Yeah. He's possessed by the... By the it's, it's, I think, the, the subject-object reversal. You see this very often in literature, you see this in myths. We create something that is supposed to serve us, be in our benefit, but it backfires I mean, and it, it maneuvers us into the corner. You can even theologically say that this happened when God created human beings. He created human beings in order to somehow... Amuse himself. Yeah, maybe, or to increase his utility. Okay. You know, yes. If, if you, yeah. these, human beings, uh, these human beings backfired 
And at the end of the day, one way or another, God maneuvered himself or somehow God maneuvered into the position that he had to sacrifice himself. Decrease his utility. Yes. You know, very much. Poor God. Yeah. In a way, this is, this is one way how to read. This often happens with your own creation. This thing repeats itself with us and technology. We've created technology. We've created the system around us. This is the point with, when you, which you see in Matrix. Human beings create technology. Something happens. We created technology to slave us. At the end of the day, we are slaves <clears throat> of technology lying there, really just being used for energy purposes. Of, um, I wonder whether this was ecological. But it was, actually. It was and renewable. But anyway. Um, one of your goals, excuse me for interrupting you, one of your goals is to, to free us from your own, from your own profession. Yeah, I think, I think if you, I mean, there's a nice quote uh, from John Stuart Mill, the one who is only an economist will never be a very good economist. You know, I think this also works for artists. You know, if you're only an artist, only an artist, you'll never be a very good artist. If you're only a philosopher, you'll never be a very good philosopher. You actually have to have some, some other input there. But the problem That's is... That's why you want to write a novel. For example, yeah. to, 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 to write a novel. But the, the problem there is that we um, try to make economics a, 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 a physics-like science. Physics is a science that deals with dead objects. And we completely forgot that we are, in a way, part of humanities. And we are not dead. And that we are not yeah. dead, that we're dealing Yet. actually with human beings. Yeah. Another quote from the, from, the first, from, the, from the foreword. You say... All of economics is, in the end, economics of good and evil. It's the telling of stories by people, of people, to people. Even the most sophisticated mathematical model is de facto a story, a parable, our effort to rationally grasp, grasp the world around us. Um, so even like even a quotation, equation is, is, is a myth. Even all it, the mathematics we can find in economics is, are you saying, is yeah. based on myth-making? It's... it's uh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Weintraub, who was uh, a top mathematician and economist of, of the last century, he even went a little further and he said every mathematical model is an autobiography of that particular person or of the age that you live in. To take an example, you know, we, I think we believe that um, philosophy, psychology, soft skills is sort of an icing on the cake ethics of hard fact economics. I argue exactly the other way around. Mathematical economics is a tip of an iceberg of thousands of years of development and beliefs. And of course, every, every formula you can de deconstruct as this is a mortified thing in which we believe. This is how we be believe we behave. It's like um, a parable, and this is where the problem begins. You know, let's take a, an extreme example of a parable Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Now, what do we mean? We don't exactly mean that he's got yellow fluffy hair, he eats uh, raw meat, and that his average lifespan is nine and a half years. We don't mean this. We mean something different. The problem is if you take this parable and extend it to, to everything. And, and this, I think, is the difference between poetry or literature and, and, and sort, of, um, sort of science. Uh, when I say of a woman, she is like a flower. I can say this, and we can even argue, you can say, no, she's not like a flower. We can even have a fight over it. But scientifically speaking, that's nonsense. I mean, take a flower and a, a female, and they have, come on, nothing in common. I mean, one doesn't produce photosynthesis, the other one doesn't talk. It's just, I mean, <laughs> are you out of your mind? What do you mean by saying she equals or is like flower? This is nonsense. Scientifically speaking. In fact, scientifically speaking, you should compliment your woman like, okay, darling, today you're 97% beautiful. You know, I've seen today only 3% women that are more beautiful than you. You know, your nose is 16%. Sorry, I must be quite honest there with you. But your hips really make it up because that's 99 on a statistical scale of 5%, you know, statistical significance. <laughs> Somehow, this does not, it never worked for me. So, speaking scientifically. So what you do is you have to be ridiculously poetic, you have to become a liar, and you have to say something like, you know, darling, today you are like a, a sun rising over a Sahara desert. You Which is to, a complete nonsense. Of course, you know, so you have, it to be, works. you have to be a liar to be, in order to be effective. Yes, yes. 
And you are saying this is the difference between art and scientists? Yeah. Yeah, we don't understand. Science does not understand that But words don't mean anything by themselves, the context. If in a different culture you said she's like a flower, somebody might hit you. I, I agree, but I think one of the you say in this book that that scientists should should uh, study philosophers, religion, myth more better. Yeah, because and otherwise you're producing non. -num Let's take a different. And, and also, I mean, if I can finish this sentence, I think you are also saying that the scientist should also be a seducer. He should be seductive also, because otherwise nobody's listening to him. Yes, a storyteller. Yeah, he should be Absolutely. a yeah. yeah. Um, so how do you combine these two things? On the un perfect. Um, Let's take a different, contrary example to the flower example, and that comes from my favorite scientific novel, which is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. There, the main plot was people were sick and tired of philosophers, artists, and, and poets trying to solve the ultimate question about the meaning of life, universe, and everything, because everybody has its own opinions, and blah, blah, blah. It's very subjective and very fluffy. So what they do is they construct a, a computer of the size of Earth, that is supposed to give an ultimate answer to the ultimate question of meaning of life, universe, and everything. So this computer goes into deep hibernation, says, I understand the question, give me two million years and I will calculate the answer to you. In the meantime, philosophers go on strike because they fear that they would lose their job once this question is resolved. And after these two million years, the computer wakes from his sleep and says, okay, I do have the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. I've QED it many times, I've tested it and run through all sorts of filters, and the answer is 42. I think this is what we're doing without philosophy. Because what's the problem with, the, why is it funny? Well, it's again a number, which is what we want. This is sort of what you want. You want a computer to do it, you want it to be objective, you want it to be rational, you want the answer to be number, and you want some very complicated mathematics that nobody understands. This is our idea of the truth. Because we trust mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It Foolishly. seems to be exact. And that's a nice it thing. It seems to be. It, and it is. And, and that's, in a way, the nice thing and the ugly thing also about mathematics. It's exact. And there are so many situations in life where you actually don't want to be exact. Where you actually want to be fuzzy, intentionally. Stupid example. Um, let's imagine that you are a lady. Yes. For a while. For a while, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, and I take you out for drink. Yes. Uh, the nice thing about economics, I can assume that you will not say no. And we're sitting in the bar, and uh, I say, darling, what would you like to have? And you said, I'd like to have a glass of red wine. I said, wonderful, here's eight euros. Exactly. You no. would get insulted. Absolutely. And I would say, well, what's the problem? I, if I give the eight euros to you or if I give it to the, to the waiter. Well, the problem is that I showed in an inappropriate relationship because our relationship is not supposed to be quid for quote. It's not supposed to be exact. That's why when you give a gift, you take out the, the, the price tag because that's what's insulting but, about it. But you it. go too fast. I want to speak later about gifts, but okay. Okay, but, but sorry. Um, we come back to gifts. Yeah. First, because the, first, the gifts belong to your chapter about Christianity. Yeah. yeah, the Ramesh. And you start the first, the oldest story in the world, according to this book, is Gilgamesh. Yes. You start, and one of the one of the things you say about this, maybe it's if people don't know the story, it's it's not necessary to retell the whole story. But one of the things that's important in the story is the difference between nature and the city. In this story, it's the nature. Evil is very much nature. Yes. And the city is where is the good place. Yes. And later in the Old Testament, we will see that's completely opposite. So can you comment a bit on this? Why is this so? Because you, it's a few, few paragraphs you, devi you devote to this theme. Why is it so important for you? Why is this so interesting? It's an interesting question for me because uh, I, you, one needs to answer, ask the question, the nature of man. Is man good by nature, in the state of nature, or does he need to be civilized, uh, denaturalized, so to speak, for him to become, become, become good? Is goodness a product of civilization, or is civilization what's actually causing in harm, harm and evil? And um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it was the city that produced good, and and natural state of things was evil, something that needed to be uh, something that needed to be tamed. Um, natural state is not presented as a state of harmony, which you see, for example, in the Old Testament, even in the Greek myths. Um, 
the Garden of Eden, and even before Prometheus gives his dubious gifts to mankind of Techni, we lived in ignorance. Also, Adam and Eve lived in some sort of moral ignorance. They didn't know the difference Because, between yeah. good and evil. That's very important. Yeah, they didn't know the difference. So and that's why, why they were good. That's why they, they, were, they... They lived in bliss, in they the state did, of bliss. They lived in bliss, they were ignorant. They were ignorant. Um, also, uh, Enkidu, who is, who is sort of a brute animal, that gets transformed into a human being in the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's a very interesting quote in, in one of the, one of the um, um, stones, or plateaus. Um, it says, um, Enkidu gained reason, but animals ran away from him. So he lost this sort of harmony with nature, this is a one-way process, by gaining reason and understanding. Also in the Greek, mythology, people lived in some sort of ignorant harmony, and uh, Prometheus gives them techni, fire, technology, okay. knowledge. This angered gods, and, Very much. and, and they sent Pandora as, as, as a punishment. And that punished also Prometheus. So it's an interesting thing that some sort of progress is the beginning of, 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 of culture, but also even in the old stories, this is something that we in a way regret opening. The Pandora box should have been closed. But also in, in the first, in, in Gilgamesh, there is no progress. Everything, in the end, everything starts where it begins. There's yes. no progress, it's an idea that comes much later. And even evil wasn't moral, so to speak. When evil things happen, it wasn't anybody's blame. Today, if a tree falls on a bear in a forest, we don't look for morality, it just happened. If that tree falls on a human being, we immediately look for guilt. Whose fault was, was it? Mm -hmm. Was it his fault? Was it fault of the, um, uh, of the gardener? Or was it the fault of God's? Why? Uh, so we have, or Hebrews have given good and bad a moral side to it. Even Hebrews interpret history as a result of, of morality. Me. Something happens, good or evil, yeah. and then a historical, historical reaction is a, is a consequence. Okay. This is quite interesting, and this is something that we are still battling with in, in the economy today. Still in the chapter about Gilgamesh, uh, you write something that Michael Novick said, an economist also, a colleague of yours, and you write, uh, Michael Novick argues that only democratic capitalism, as opposed to alternative frequently utopian systems, understood how deeply evil nature is rooted in the human soul, and realize that it is beyond any system to uproot this deeply embedded sin. And I think you, you, you agree with him, that it's only democratic capitalism that... Or it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, because there he has very many, 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 many things there. First of all, the, the quote that human nature is by, by nature evil is something that is more of, uh, of, of the Babylonian Times. pagan tradition. Okay. In the Hebrew, especially in the Old Testament, human beings were created good, and the core is still good. The nature actually is good, and we got spoiled by cities. Sodom and Gomorrah, okay. Babylon, it, that's where evil happens. So culture was not something that we looked up to. Progress was not something that we look up to, but it's something that actually deteriorates human beings. Even in the New Testament, you don't have this idea of salvation as a progress but it's more salvation as a return. You know, even metanoia, repentance, means return. You know, go back to yourself. Not go forward to yourself, but go back to the, to the original. But to still the original. to this day, the idea of the, the city as being the, being the center of evil is highly popular. Yeah. Among the Taliban, but also yeah. among Christians, among yes. religious people. Yes. And even today, when you know, if you, if you have these spiritual people say, you know, we should slow down, means that we're not going in the right direction, you know. So, so this whole idea of progress, which of course is a fundamental thing for economics in terms of GDP growth, you get from, from sort of the, the soft part of arts and religion is to slow, you know, the role of art is people to stop and think, mm -hmm. you know? So in other words, the contrary to that is not to stop and continue, and that's supposed to be bad. You're supposed to contemplate, stop, think, maybe go back a couple of steps. So we have this in our mentality, and what intrigues me is, Where does this come from? Come from. One more quote from uh, the chapter about Gilgamesh, um, from the last pages. The less a civilized city person is dependent on nature, the more he or she is dependent on the rest of society. Like Enkidu, we have exchanged nature for society. Harmony with incalculable nature for harmony with man. 
Do you think this is a wise exchange? Or do you think it's unavoidable to, sp we, we cannot go back, so we have to accept it, whether we like it, it or not? We're, we're not dependent, uh, we're not dependent on the whims of, of nature. This room will always have 22 degrees, whether it's raining out there or if it's heat or, or cold, it will be constant temperature here. This is the result of civilization. We are independent of what's happening outside. It can be snowing, it, whatever, we don't care. It's but we think we are. It yeah, might be an illusion. But, but as long as the, as long, as as long long as as the no society earthquakes. works, yeah. we're fine. So we are very independent of the nature, but we have become extremely dependent on the rest of the society. None of us can find the source of fresh water, I think. Uh, so we are dependent, even on water, on a specialized society. I specialize on a small little tiny fraction of whatever. You also, you do a small thing. And in exchange, the society closes me. And I didn't put this together, and I even don't know how to do it. In fact, I don't know who did it, and I don't care who did it. I consider it my own, and it is properly my own. But the thing is, I'm dependent on my clothing, and on my fooding, and on everything, on my entertainment, on the rest oh, of the society. Mm -hmm. So we believe in this fundamental freedom and independence, but yet, in fact, we are more dependent on others than ever before. before. We are actually very strong as a society, but very weak as individuals. In the state of nature, I would die in, 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 in two days with my economic teaching. I mean, come on. But this specialization is also the, the source of our wealth. Yes. Yes. But that wealth isn't properly yours. It's, your wealth is wealthy only in the society that has sort of produced it or respected it. Your iPhone and my iPhone, or, or I mean, sorry, my... Uh, your Samsung. Samsung, just, yeah, your exactly. Samsung, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, is useless in, in sub-Saharan Amazonia. It only makes sense in, uh, in, in the state of nature. I mean, in, 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 the, state, in, in the, the city. Of in in yeah. the city and society. Yeah. And even values. I mean, chair has only value in a society. If you see a chair in the jungle, that chair has no meaning. The only conclusion you can draw from it, some human being must have left it here or dropped it from the plane, but in, it doesn't have a meaning in its own self. It only has a meaning for us to sit upon. Tree has a purpose of its own, um, and so do animals. But the things that we meddle with, and we actually we use a lot of violence. I mean, this tree is a product of, of a lot of violence. Of violence? Of violence, yeah. I mean, we took a tree, we took out of the earth um, stones, we made it into iron, tortured it with high heat temperatures, made it into a saw, cut the tree, dried it on the sun, you know, forced it into shapes that's not natural for it. And this, I think, is the topic of horrors, that this chain of uh, order of events reverses, that nature suddenly starts applying these things to in us. a reverse manner. Take, I don't know, the, the very simple Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I don't know, is it... It's, I don't know, it's, it might it be you, be yes. Yeah. It might be you, yeah. Be let's, let's solve it. Is it yeah. okay? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, but then again, nobody can hear me. But that's maybe better. I don't know. You can, yeah, I can hear you. That's fine. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. The, the nature, usually in a, in a form of a madman or a child, they don't have rationality, or animals. Oh, now he's coming so to Somebody hit. comes I didn't to do fix anything. it. Yeah. So that's another example of a specialist doing what you cannot do. No, I can't even speak with that. No. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, nature starts reversing this, this flow of events, and it starts attacking us in the same way that we've been attacking it. Um, this, I think, is this primordial fear that we still have. Taking yes. a chainsaw 